We will time you, um, and a number, apparently there are a lot of people that do want to speak, so we want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to speak. So at three minutes, I will ask you to end your remarks, but you have three minutes to make your public comments. We ask, as always, everyone, would you please be respectful, um, courteous. If you cannot be respectful and courteous, then we'd ask that you um, exit the meeting at this time. You know, there's no swearing, there's no name calling, there's no yelling. Um, if you want to be heard, we need to understand you without any um, inappropriate language or, or uh, any appropriate remarks. Definitely want to hear what you have to say, so speak up, speak clearly, but just please, no profanity, no yelling, no screaming, and treat everyone with respect, the same respect that you would expect. Um, and with that being said, let's do roll call. Uh, Councilman Katina. I am the designee for Councilman Katina, Bethany Hallam. Thank you. Uh, Richard Fitzgerald. Steve Polarski for the executive. Terry Klein. Present. Gail Moss. Present. Abbas Camara. Camara. Acting Controller Tracy Royster. Present. Sheriff Kevin Krause. Present. Beth Lazara. Judge Beth Lazara. Present. <coughs> that's everyone, right? I think that's everyone. Uh, point of order, Judge Halsey? Yes. Um, yes, I just would like the record to reflect that Steve Polarski checked in as an illegal designee in conflict with the state statute. Again, for like the millionth time, the county executive either has to participate himself or he doesn't have anybody participate. There are only designees for the president judge, the seat that you hold, and the president of council, the seat that I hold. Thank you very much. You're welcome. With that being said, we will begin with the community corrections report. Passages to recovery. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Corsi. I am the director of residential services for Passages to Recovery. Um, in the past month, we've done some work to add additional services coming into the program. We've had uh, two agencies um, providing peer support, one uh, certified peer support, which is mental health support, and the other certified recovery support, which is drug and alcohol support services. Uh, we have also um, uh, begun talks with uh, People's Oakland uh, to be able to come into the agency to provide services and also uh, for us to be able to send our clients uh, to make connections with them. Um, they have a number of uh, services, both uh, housing um, and other types of things, employment, um, trying to work with folks that may be wanting to return to services but have uh, past crimes that might get in the way. They help them work through that. Uh, and lastly, we have started on our road to start resuming visits with, for clients. We've been uh, doing, for probably the past month or so, um, court-ordered uh, visits with children that were uh, ordered by CYF. So we've been doing that successfully for the past month or so and are working on uh, trying to get normal kind of visits back up and running with, for clients. So that's pretty much it for today. How is your COVID count doing among staff and residents? Uh, we actually had, uh, had up until recently, had no real issues. This morning, this afternoon, I had a staff member uh, who tested positive um, and is fully vaccinated, but tested positive nonetheless, so she'll be out for five days. Other than that, no problems. Now hear from the Renewal Center. Good afternoon, board. Frank DeClaire reporting for Renewal. Uh, last month, we reported that we were preparing for a pre-audit, which took place on the 13th through the 17th of June. I'm happy to report that our preliminary findings in the closing with the auditor, uh, we were 100% compliant with all the mandatory and non-mandatory standards and exceeded uh, some of the standards um, for that audit. So we have not received the final report, uh, but once we do, we'll forward that on to the, to the jail for, for review. Uh, secondly, um, we, this week we rolled out a new software and tracking system for our reentrance. Um, all data has been migrated and staff is working hard to fix some of the kinks that we find in the system, but uh, we're very confident in the system and pleased um, in it. And lastly, um, 
our staff, our treatment staff will be participating in the upcoming recovery uh, walk, uh, and they'll be taking some of our inpatient uh, treatment reentrance to the walk. COVID, um, we currently have zero COVID uh, positive reentrance in the center. Uh, we did have one staff that was out. He returns to work tomorrow, um, and so it's been been very good. So, knock on wood. Any other questions? Yes. I have a question. When when they do have when they do test positive, how long do they stay off? Staff. Yes. So we do uh, ten days from their first um, symptoms, first signs of symptoms. Okay. So having shots doesn't... No, we... Okay. Across okay. the board, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated. Err on a side of caution there. Okay. Yes, Beth. Thank you. Um, how many folks who are currently in Renewal Center have outside employment? Currently employed yeah. or eligibility for employment? No, like are actually working. Um, I do not have the exact numbers. I think last month... I'm in the process of running that report with the new system. There's a little bit of a delay. Um, I believe last month we were around 75% uh, employment. In the center as a whole, we were uh, above 80% last month. Okay, and I there's- I don't have the exact figures on me today, I apologize. Okay, no, that's that's like, I was just kind of looking for a rough estimate. If you could, at following meetings, maybe bring those numbers. I'd Absolutely. like to kind of watch that. Certainly. Um, so I have a question specifically. So, so you garnish, well not you, Renewal Center garnishes a percentage of any pay that the folks who are in Renewal Center get, correct? So there's been a change in that recently. So currently we only, uh, collect 10% and that's just for court costs and fines. Previously there was 20% uh, for room and board that is no longer. Uh, previously there was 10% went toward mandatory savings for them and then when they got released they would get a check. Uh, that has been taken away as well. So currently the only money that's taken from reentrance when they're employed, when there is income, is 10% for their court costs and fines and that's paid directly to those counties or? That's whatever. what I was gonna ask. It's paid directly from you. You take it from their paycheck and then Renewal Center disperses it to the courts. Correct. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And when did that change happen? Say uh, maybe a month or two ago. Okay, so it's, it's been a few months. Okay, this is just the first I've heard of it. Yep. So thank you very much. Uh, and that's all I have. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, we'll now hear the electronic monitoring report. Hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to review the minutes from the June 2nd board meeting. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. All right, uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion will carry. Minutes are approved. Old business, um, suicide prevention subcommittee. We are to have an update on the status of reinspections from NCCHC. Good afternoon, board. Good afternoon. I would just like to report to the board the same report that I gave last month. NCCHC is reporting to the jail on August the 22nd of this year to do their re-inspection. So I will not have any updates pertaining to the NCC uh, report until after that inspection on August the 22nd. Yes. Yeah, uh, will you be providing this board with a copy of that report when it's finalized? Yes, we will. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, update from the subcommittee regarding the suicide prevention. I think that's the one that we still don't know who's on the subcommittee. So we, we need to sort of have a who's on that subcommittee. I'm on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I was too, but then and then once once uh, she left, our chair left, we sort of haven't figured out what's going on with it. I don't know if Steve automatically became <laughs> the chair of that subcommittee. <laughs> Should we have an executive session to 
details about it now? I actually think an executive session in general to talk about the various committees and make sure that we have the right committees in place and make sure their scopes are well defined would be a great idea. Not just for this one, but for all of them. All right, we, 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 we have a couple of things and I think I'm going to start, I'm going to defer to Terry Klein first because she has the update on the survey with the Pitt School of Social Work. So this has been a long time in coming and we still have to wait. My understanding is that uh, it got delayed due to COVID issues at with uh, Dean Farmer's group. She, uh, she is planning to have I guess there was a preliminary report. Uh, Aaron Dalton made some comments, sent it back to the School of Social Work for their final report. The final report will be delivered to Ms. Dalton on she, uh, the 20th, so. 20th of July, right? 20th of July, so here's hoping that we'll have, and after uh, Ms. Dalton has a chance to review it, then we will get a copy. It's my understanding, and then we'll be glad to share it. Well, j just for some background for those of you who may not have be following um, our survey, uh, we the the in incarcerated individuals welfare fund um, f thought that perhaps there could be some uh, better uses of the incarcerated individual welfare fund money and uh, we decided that we should not be the ones that just automatically decide on where the money should go because we're not in the Allegheny County Jail and so uh, we were able to contract with the Pitt School of Social Work and they have run a survey with the um, people that are in the jail to find out what their needs are so that any uh, any decisions made about the incarcerated individuals welfare fund would take into account the um, needs and desires of the folks who are currently in the Allegheny County Jail. So just to give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to ask Aaron Dalton if there's anything she wanted to add. Yeah, we just, we just need the final draft. Um, and it, it was a very, um, a lot of people participated and a lot of people gave uh, a lot of comments and so that's I think what made it delay a little bit longer is that Pitt wasn't expecting to have such robust um, answers to the survey questions. So it's taken them a little bit more time to um, actually finalize everything and distill it all down to a report. Uh, the second thing that our committee has been working on for quite some time is the liaison position. Um, for those of you again, this is designed to be a uh, a position, a full-time position that would be uh, advisory to this board. It would not make decisions. It would be advisory to this board and it would be able to go into the Allegheny County Jail and sort of check on things and how, how are things doing. So if we get a lot of complaints about the food, this person is going to be down there eating the food. So we're going to find out what the situation is in the jail about the food. Um, and it's designed to give us the actual real-time assessment of what's going on in the jail. We think it's an incredibly important position um, and we have been working so many months to try to get this done. Uh, we had a little bit of a detour when we tried to get the um, Pennsylvania um, Prison Society to uh, subcontract with us to provide a person. That did not work. Uh, we then said we thought we needed somebody that would be um, internal and so um, Sheriff Krause uh, very kindly offered his office to house that position. So so that position will be housed there. Housing, it means that we need a place for um, payroll to be run and uh, basically to um, be a supervisor in the sense of, are you here, at, what hours are you working, what's up with the payroll, those kind of things. This board will supervise and direct the actual work uh, of that person. And uh, Sheriff Kraus was uh, very kind to do that. So what we need to do now is fill that position um, we've had some research uh, occurring uh, through Ms. Royston's office. She has been um, having some people figure out where we can do all the advertising for that, what it's going to cost us, how we're going to proceed. And so what we want to do is come up with a report to provide to this board for approval that would have um, where all the advertising would be for the position and a timeline of here's when we're going to do the ads, here's when we're going to close the application process, here's when we are going to actually go through 
the um, resumes. Here's when we're going to do the interviews. Here's when we're going to do that and make the hiring decision. So we want to have that pretty much set in stone so we can stop pushing this down uh, down the way. And we think that that's an important thing to do. So um, if, you, if you don't mind, I would just do that motion now if you're okay with that. Okay. okay. Oh, I thought you were motioning. I was going to second it. But I just want to add one more thing before you go through the reading of the motion is I just wanted to say that one, if anybody is listening and that sounds like the job for you or someone that you know, please tell them to pay attention to the jail board meetings because we'll be providing updates with when the application process will open, what the specific job qualifications are. Um, and also, the idea is we will be paying for this position initially as a pilot out of the Incarcerated Individual Welfare Fund with the goal being that eventually, if all goes well, that this will be a position that is just funded in the future going forward through the county, through the jail. That's, yeah, that, that, that's always been the discussion that we've had is that, that hopefully it would at some point become a line item or we would get a grant or something along the lines uh, to fund it. But we do think it's an important enough position that we want to start it with the individual incarcerated welfare fund so that we can get it moving because um, that's going to be the fastest way to do it. I, I, I don't know whether you guys want me to read the whole motion into the record. Okay, yeah? All right, so um, whereas on June 3rd, 2021, the Jail Oversight Board voted in favor of a motion presented by the IIWF subcommittee, which authorized a liaison position for the Jail Oversight Board in order to assist it in fulfilling its statutory obligations. Whereas on September 2nd, 2021, the Jail Oversight Board voted in favor of a motion presented by the IIWF subcommittee, which mandated creation of a full-time salaried position of Jail Oversight Board liaison, incorporated the proposed job description into the position, authorized a search to be conducted by the IIWF subcommittee to fill the position, and authorized payment of salary and benefits not to exceed $85,000 from the IIWF said salary and benefits to be subject to regular review by the Jail Oversight Board. Whereas search and research efforts have been conducted by the IIWF subcommittee to fill the Jail Oversight Board liaison position, including extensive conversations with the Pennsylvania Prison Society, a statutorily authorized organization since 1829, serving the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as an independent prison and jail monitor and ombuds. Whereas conversations with the P, uh, PPS Pennsylvania Prison Society were unproductive, and it was agreed by the Jail Oversight Board that the position of Jail Oversight Board liaison would be recruited, hired, and maintained in a department within the county. Whereas the Office of the Sheriff of Allegheny County has agreed to maintain the position of Jail Oversight Board liaison. It is hereby moved that the Jail Oversight Board shall approve the creation of a full-time position of Jail Oversight Board liaison within the Office of the Sheriff of Allegheny County. The Jail Oversight Board liaison shall perform the duties of the Jail Oversight Board liaison as described in the uh, job description. That's been circulated multiple times. I think the final version, Steve, you may have, so uh, he'll provide that to everybody uh, so you have it. It's essentially the same stuff with all the Pennsylvania Prison Society um, requirements taken out. Um, the Office of the Sheriff of Allegheny County shall provide administrative and supervisory support to the Jail Oversight Board for the management of the position. The Jail Oversight Board liaison shall receive assignments and report findings directly to the Jail Oversight Board. Payment for the position shall be made from the IIWF unless and until other funding sources such as grants or budget line items are approved for such payment. It is further moved that the IIWF subcommittee shall present to the Jail Oversight Board for approval a detailed plan for the recruitment and hiring of an individual for the Jail Oversight Board liaison position. This plan will utilize multiple media to advertise and recruit for the position. It shall also set forth deadlines for advertising, review of resume, and interviews. Upon the approval of the recruitment plan, the IIWF subcommittee will implement the plan. Any costs of recruiting, such as advertising, shall be paid from the IIWF, although my understanding is there should be very minimal, if any, costs for advertising. Uh, this recruitment plan shall be provided to the Jail Oversight Board for consideration and vote no later than the August Jail Oversight Board meeting. So that's the motions. Are you making that motion officially? I made that motion. Okay, I'd like to second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, and uh, what we'll do is we'll have a subcommittee meeting and we will um, put forth that plan and we'll have that in advance of the August meeting. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, 
state on compensation for work performed by incarcerated individuals at the jail? I'll give an update on that because believe it or not, actually this past week, I got the number of hours that are worked by the incarcerated workers in the jail. Uh, so it was too close to this meeting for me to actually prepare anything with them, but I do have that information and I will forward that along to the rest of the members of the board so that you can see as well. Uh, there were a total of 228 workers in the jail. Uh, the majority of them, around 125 of them, are uh, pod workers. Um, the rest are scattered between laundry, food, stuff like that. So, and so they work an average of eight hours every day. So I have that information. I will bring that to everyone ahead of the Jail Oversight Board meeting for August, and then we will discuss a plan of action from there. So that's my update. Thanks, Judge Halsey. Thank you. Any questions? Ms. Hallam, did I read you were talking to it in the last, in the minutes, consulting with the tax attorney? Yeah, so I've been looking for someone who specializes in specifically this, and they have all told me that we should talk to folks who are in corrections. So if any, if any of you know a tax attorney who this is their wheelhouse, apparently tax attorney is a much broader job than I thought it was. And they do a lot more than just like employment taxation. And so if anyone knows someone that specifically does that, I do not. I'm not connected with anyone like that. But I know we have some lawyers up here. So if you have any lawyer friends that do that, that would be great. Um, but also, I do think it's important, maybe if you can talk to your folks at the main DOC, and I can reach out to my contacts at the PA DOC, and we can find out, you know, what they do, because they are paying workers. Right. So just a general question is that when people are discharged from ACJ and they still have money on their account, are there tax implications to that when they get that back? Not that I know of, but I, again, not my wheelhouse. Okay. All right. Thanks for clarifying. Any other questions? Uh, the update is the, uh, the ADA compliance employee will not be attending the meeting. What I remember from the last meeting was Ms. Holland was supposed to be contacting Mr. Baccarat to talk about any HIPAA issues and or ADA compliance. So, uh, Any questions? Yes. Um, what I remember from the meeting was that the ADA compliance person was supposed to be here. And it was noted that there is a person and that we would like to talk to that person. And so why is that person not here? Well, what I remember from the last meeting and was that you were supposed to, because you had the conversation with Mr. Biondo. And what I remember from the meeting, from the HIPAA conversations and the ADA conversations, that you were supposed to get in touch with Mr. Baccarat. So therefore, that's why the ADA compliance employee is not here. You don't remember that this board asked you to bring the ADA compliance person here? I think I just stated that, ma'am. Okay, uh, does anyone else on the board remember that the ADA compliance person was supposed to be brought here? Well, I don't necessarily know that we have to remember. We have minutes. Right. Great. So we can, we can actually look in the minutes. That way none of us have to rely on our memories because I, I literally don't remember. Great. Um, so yes, that's actually why it's on the agenda was because it was requested that that person was brought here and you had said that would happen. That's literally what it says on the agenda, update regarding ADA compliance employee intending meetings, not update on Bethany's conversation with the county employees. So it's, it's on page uh, four of 10 um, under little Roman numeral four. Um, Warden Harper, an incarcerated individual just needs to let an ACJ staff member know either verbally written or through their electronic tablet that they're seeking or need an accommodation. It was further discussed that Ms. Hallam had previously requested that person in charge of ensuring ADA compliance regarding the incarcerated individuals is being met from a legal standpoint to come in person to a board meeting. Uh, Warden Harper will need to research who would be the appropriate person to speak to. There was also a discussion over the tier system used at the jail when evaluating incarcerated individuals, and it was requested by Judge Lazaro that a copy of the tier system be given to the board. Warden Harper agreed to send this. So that, that's what's listed in the minutes. Thanks. Warden Harper, can you please respond to that? I don't hear from the minutes that I was agreed to bring the 
ADA compliance officer to the meeting. So let's make this perfectly crystal clear. So for the next meeting, we want the ADA compliance person and we want the tier system provided. Tier system in advance and the ADA compliance person present. I will make sure that I have the ADA compliance officer here if I can. I don't manage that person, so I don't know if I can do that. Now the tier system is up, Judge Lazara. I did agree that I was going to provide the tier system document to the board, but Jan, I'm just asking that I provide that tier system documentation in the executive session because I feel as though for the safety and security of the facility that it could jeopardize the safety of the facility. So I will try to get the ADA compliance officer to come to the next meeting. I don't supervise her, but I will try. And the tier system, Your Honor, I'm just asking that we do it in executive session. And I think our plan is to try to have an executive session, right? So that should not be a problem. And who, who supervises the ADA compliance person? I thought last time it was like there was a group of people, or are we talking about a group of people come up with the tier system? There wasn't one individual that does the tier system. There was one individual that does ADA compliance. I might be confusing the two, but I know there was there wasn't there was discussion that that there's not one individual who does this. I think they're talking about two different things, uh, Mr. Polarski. So. Right. I, th I think the tier system was a committee that did the, the tier system, right? That's what that's what he said, and then the, but the ADA compliance person, there should be a person in charge of that. I mean, if it's a question as to, if I remember, it was a question in regards to the document itself and who reviewed it for compliance with ADA. Is that correct, Ms. Hallam? Well, in general, there have been multiple allegations about things that the jail is doing, even policy treatment of incarcerated individuals that is potentially in violation of the ADA. And so we were under the understanding that there is a person who is in charge of making sure that the jail's policies, and I think you clarified it was a county person who was in charge of all ADA compliance throughout the county, and that that was the person that was going to come here. But yes, the question originally arose because we, I personally, in, in my opinion, believe that the tier system is in violation of the ADA. The tier system has been reviewed by our law department, so it is not in violation, and Mr. Baccarat can talk about that. So I'm, maybe that's the answer to your question. The tier system has been evaluated by our law department. I understand, and I know that you say that about a lot of things, but specifically, we want to talk to the person who decided that it was in compliance that the jail, that this policy, are all in compliance. So that would be the law department because the clinical document, and Ms. Madden can speak more to that document, but it would be the legal department to determine that version. But, but if you're talking about a person who reviews compliance from an employee level, that would be handled by a different county department. So it is Mr. Backrack from the law department? Yeah. Yes. Uh, right, that's what I thought. The law department looked at it, we didn't have any Okay, so to be clear, are you the person that we should direct questions to about the jail's compliance with the ADA, both today and going forward? Because I'm being told it's the law department. The law department looked at the document and we didn't have any legal objection to the tier system. That's what I can tell you. Okay, well, we would like to talk with. I don't, I don't uh, manage that. Who does? I don't know. Uh, I don't manage the, the jail. We just looked at it from a legal point of view. Who specifically handles that at the jail is a different matter. So you do not believe that it is someone in the legal department? That, I, I don't know what your question is. Can someone rephrase? Okay, so what we're trying to do is talk to the person or people who say that this policy and other policies at the jail are in compliance with the ADA. In other jails and prisons, they have somebody who makes sure that the jail's policies and procedures, the actions that they're taking inside the jail, do not violate the ADA in order to, you know, protect from future lawsuits for violations. But when you say well, ADA, go ahead, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. What I can say is a lot of part when it looked at the document and it had no objection, legal objection to it. That, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so at the last meeting, 
Warden Harper was supposed to research to find who the appropriate person to speak to was regarding ADA compliance. Is that not you? I wasn't. You brought a question for me to answer what do you mean by ADA compliance. I can tell you what the water department did. It reviewed the tier system and it had no legal objections to that. Okay, and when you say the law department, that is comprised of people who are lawyers, correct? Okay, so we would like to talk to those people. I, I don't really understand what you're saying. It was reviewed by several people at the law department, and there was no objection to it. Okay, and we would like to speak with those several people who reviewed it and had no objection to it. So, so, so I've talked to the solicitor, but the law department general does not provide legal advice in a public session. But I think what you're saying. That from our perspective, the document is, is, is legal. That's what I can tell you. But just to back up on what you're saying, Bethany, Thank ADA is, is a law. And there are people who enforce that law. So when the legal department decided that this policy was legal, the question is, was there, was part of that legal review to make sure that it was in compliance with ADA laws? I, I can't answer that. So that's what we're asking. Who would we check that by? Various people at the law department include people who deal with the ADA, so yes, it was looked at there. I can't say as I stand here right now that, that this individual person looked at it specifically for ADA. So in between now and the next meeting, can you provide us with a contact person that we could follow up with and ask that question to? I understand the board wants to know if it's possible to the law department Correct. I can speak to the solicitor and we can get back to you whether we think there's a lot of whether we think specifically as to that specific question. Um, Thank you. I think that's what we're looking for. Yes, and again, not just a yes or no. That's not what we're looking for. We didn't ask for a legal opinion to be presented to this board. We specifically want to speak with the people who made those decisions to find out the rationale. I can't, I can't agree that that, that would happen. That would have to be a decision you'd have to make up with the solicitor. Right, but with all due respect, Mr. Baccarat, we as the Joe Oversight Board already made that decision that we want that information, and that's really all it takes. The solicitor can come to us, as was supposed to happen, between the last meeting and now, we're now saying you can have one more month, but we want to talk with those people. I understand what you're saying. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Or, or disagree, but I understand what you're saying. Yes, I appreciate that. I really was not looking for your specific opinion, whether you agreed or disagreed. We would just like those people. I, Thank I, you. I understand the request. Thank you. Can I make a suggestion? Because I think that um, you know, we, we do have these discussions sometimes and we're unsure what the action items are that come out of the meetings. Um, as secretary for this board, maybe it would be helpful, and Warden Har Harper, tell me if it would, if there are follow-up items, uh, maybe shortly after this board meeting, we could just alert you to them so that there's no question. Would that be helpful to you? Absolutely. Okay. So can I make sure that I'm clear? Mm -hmm. The law department will make a determination as to whether or not they're going to be at the next meeting to talk about ADA compliance to the tier system, right? No, they will not make the determination. We made the determination that they will come to the next meeting. So what will happen is they will come. Any other questions? All right. Update regarding Summit's dietitian attending the meeting, Warden Harper. 
Summers dietitian will not be attending the meeting. And what I remember from the last meeting was that the board was going to provide questions to me to submit to the dietitian to answer. I have not received any questions from the board to submit to Summit to answer. Any questions? Yes, Judge Housie. We have requested multiple times to speak with the Summit dietitian. We would like to speak with them. Please bring them here. So that's an action item for the list. We want the dietitian. And again, I mean, we can go back and forth with semantics as long as we want, but both of these people now for months we've been trying to talk with. Summit, I can't even, does anyone know, my colleagues up here, how long we've been trying to talk with a dietitian? I mean, it's the one recurring theme every single month is the food. We've been asking for this over and over and over again. Like, what needs to be made more clear to understand that we want the dietitian here? How, how can he require the dietitian to be here? They have a contract with us. With the county. If Summit has a contract. If they're in violation of the contract, then cut it off tomorrow. Ref refusing to not come to the meeting doesn't violate the contract. But if a person, if he's saying, hey, the board wants to speak to you, and we're saying the board wants to speak to you, and the dietitian is saying we're not coming, what, 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 what more would you have this warden do? What else should he do? What should be his next action step? May I have the dietitian's contact information, and I will get them myself to come here. I will provide you with the information for the dietitian. Thank you very much, Warden Harper. All right. Any other questions? We did say last time at the last meeting, I believe Ms. Royston suggested at the very end to try to give them a list of questions ahead of time so this wasn't an I gotcha because that wasn't the purpose of this. So that's my recollection of it. We said we would give them a list of questions that we have. It wasn't in the, I didn't see it in the minutes either, but that's my recollection. Okay, so maybe. It was at the end. Well, we can talk about this more at executive session specifically. We can devise those questions, yeah. but um, if Bethany wants to reach out to them, see their availability, and then we can prepare that for the next meeting. All right. Well, I would say, as an, out of an abundance of caution, just prepare the questions in the event that they refuse to not come, you can still get the answers that you're seeking, regardless of whether or not they come. I don't know if they'll come. I do not know these people, but I'm just saying I still would prepare the questions so it's not wasted time. Any other questions? All right, RFP for commissary vendors, uh, Warden Harper. The commissary RFP has been posted and we're excited that the RFP has been posted. Any questions? All right, thank you. All right, well now, uh, Proceed to having our public comments. We skipped one, Judge Halsey. Number of incarcerated individuals at ACJ forgive waiting me, to go upstate. I, forgive me, I checked it off and okay. didn't read it. My apologies. Number of incarcerated, sorry about that. Number of incarcerated individuals at the jail waiting to go upstate, Warden Harper. Your Honor, I have those numbers. Okay. Good. Thanks. Current 300 Bs in the facility are 70 males, two females. Three males currently current serving a county sentence, so once those folks are paroled from those sentences, then they will be transferred upstate. Uh, and we have six males with open cases. We have 36 males set for transfer to the DOC this month. Any questions? Yeah, in the other half, you have, it sounds like about half is being sent next month. What are the other folks waiting on? Transfer to the DOC. Okay, but they what? Let us, they let us know when they have room and they can accept them. So we're waiting on room at the state penitentiaries? Correct. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Any other questions? All right, we'll now proceed to have hearing our public comments. Again, I will remind you, um, if you did not provide an address on this sign-in sheet, you will not be permitted to speak. Your comments must be limited to three minutes. We'd ask that you strictly adhere to those guidelines, uh, three minutes. And we will start with Mr. Kostinowitz. Warden Harper at our last JOB meeting stated that ACGA's death rate is at an average with the rest of the country as identified by the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics. 
Referring to Table 16 of the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics regarding county jails of a size of 1,000 to 2,500 census, the average rate of death is 179 per 100,000 people, which computes to between two or three deaths a year. Since April of 2020, ACJ far exceeds the two to three average death rate per year identified by the U U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics. Staffing crisis. Recently, 13 correctional officers have left employment at ACJ. Some people are saying that officers, quote, are dropping like flies. As more officers leave, more officers will be assigned to forced overtime, affecting their physical and mental health and the stability of their families. 50% of the officers who were recently hired have resigned. The JLB voted last year by a vote of six to one to conduct exit interviews. It is critical that the board act on their commitment to conduct interviews and set up a structure that protects a person's confidentiality and gives the person resigning the opportunity to talk about the reasons for leaving and what the county and ACJ administration could have done to support the persons to stay. We are all in agreement that the JOB, JOB receives very little information from the ACJ administration concerning a death that occurs at the jail. Investigating the cause of death and instituting measures to prevent further deaths is a critical process that must be undertaken. The board needs to know whether ACJ is complying with the NCCHC standard JA09 procedure in the event of a death that I've mentioned to the board in the past. Since NCCHC is being scheduled to conduct an assessment of ACJ's compliance with their recommendations on suicide prevention in August, I would like the board to ask NCCHC to assess ACJ's compliance with the JA09 standard regarding the investigation of deaths at the time of their August visit. <laughs> Based on state statute, Warden Harper is required to provide medical records, review of those people who have died at ACJ to the, J to the Jail Oversight Board. Relying on HIPAA is not a defense because the HIPAA law does not restrict entities from receiving the records of deceased individuals if they are providing insight. <laughs> okay. Your Honor, could I, any response? Your Honor, could I respond to the uh, death um, uh, data that uh, he does provide, please? Point of order, Judge Halsey. Uh, if I'm not allowed to respond to public comments, the warden isn't either. We don't respond to public comments. Okay. We don't respond to public comments. Thank you. But for the record, members of the board are allowed to respond to public comments, so. We now have, uh, we'll hear from I believe this is, forgive me if I don't get your name correct, but it looks like Brett Armheim. Is Armheim? My apologies, sir. You have three minutes. Hello, my name is Brett Amron. I work at the jail as a corrections officer and I'm a union steward. It's a shame that I have to actually come to speak on issues at the jail that, are, that fail to get addressed by our administration. Judge Lazara, I know you're busy, but you have reached, we have been, you have been reached out to numerous occasions about the cutting of an officer on a mental health pod 5F as you were on the JOB and also the mental health court judge. We have not received any responses from you. You stated at the last JOB meeting, you referred to these individuals as my people, but you were reached out to concerning your people and there was, there was no response. These are the same people that you see in your courtroom every single day. The, cut, the removal of the second officer from the mental health unit 5F provides inadequate supervision to the mental health individuals on pod 5F. There is a reason this pod has been a two officer pod for the past eight plus years. This decision was made by an individual without any mental health experience or any mental health background. 
This decision was not made before consulting anyone from the suicide prevention team or the officers that worked that unit. You guys have a statutory obligation to the incarcerated individuals in the jail, and by taking no actions and doing nothing, you guys are just as guilty as our administration for if and when something happens. You do know that you can order them to put the officer back on 5F. They're clearing, this is a safety issue, they're clearing mental health individuals off of the acute mental health pods faster than ever now because there is no room. 5F used to be the overflow mental health unit for new courts, and now since they refuse to give us the second officer back, they are clearing mental health individuals to general population units to make room for new ones. This is creating a safety issue for other housing units, housing mental health individuals when they should not be. We work in a toxic work environment. All the warden and his administration does is harass officers at the jail and hand out code of ethics hearings. They're equipped to write up officers for anything and everything in order to create a hostile work environment. They also just hired a video surveillance team to watch officers all day and night and review cameras to see if we were breaking any policies. I would like to address any officer watching this right now that this is the time to fight back. I mean, we did have Pizzagate. Even the Deputy County Manager Polarski stated that if our vendor, which is not our fault, does not show up to work, we have to eat out of the vending machines that cannot order pizza for the officers. Or when we get forced to do five doubles in a row like Officer Hawkins does, we came in to order a pizza to boost morale for everyone's appreciation for staying that week. There's no morale in this building. We can't get uniforms. We were once again ordered by Polarski to get hand-me-down uniforms from retired officers or, off or uniforms that don't fit us anymore. Um, this is how our administration and county think about us and it needs to stop. We're not taking the disrespect anymore. We're not laying down. We deserve a better work environment. Uh, it's not all negative, though. I want to give a shout out to all the 311 staff members that do their jobs. We all appreciate you. We all work as a team together. Doesn't go unnoticed. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll now hear from uh, Brian Engler. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Engler, I'm president of the Corrections Officers Union at the jail. I'm on vacation this week, I'd rather be in my pool right now with my family, but I'm here again to talk about the same things I always talk about, understaffing, lack of uniform, safety issues. Um, I do come up here and speak about uh, these issues under fear of retaliation and harassment. Every time I come to these meetings, I get a write-up. I mean, that's just a little ridiculous. Um, I want to talk about officer hiring. The county will tell you that we're doing our best. We're hiring 20 new officers. The sad reality is, is we lose half of these officers. I went to county council this week to ask if they could extend hiring, uh, living outside the county to new corrections officers as well as implement a hiring bonus. If you gave $2,000 to the first 50 hires, that's $100,000. The county has a $50 million surplus, according to their, uh, Controller Royston's report. The pension is drastically underfunded. It should be at 80%. It's fallen below 33%. Correction officers and nurses take a lot of money out of that pension. You need more people feeding into that pension and you just don't have it. I also want to talk about a report that came out in February about the food service at the jail. Had these results been posted outside of our lounge, we would have never eaten there. Had it been outside your, your favorite restaurant, you would have eaten there. Some of the things that concerned me were boxes of frozen, mechanically chick separated chicken with uh, labeled export to Philippines, or um, two hotel pans of rice out at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which were uh, kept at a low temperature, um, high risk, uh, live rodents, live German cockroaches, and American cockroaches. I don't know how you tell the difference on that. This is disgusting that we weren't even notified. And then when we do do something like try to order pizza, we're told to eat out of the vending machines. I mean, the vending machines go empty all weekend. They're not restocked until Monday or Tuesday. The lack of care or concern for the officers in this jail is just extraordinary. I mean, the fact that nobody knew the food was this bad and we're eating there every day with rodent droppings and rodent urine on the trays is disgusting. And you know, one time I shook down the kitchen and I saw like 20 trays on a rack. And they all look perfect, and they were numbered one through 20. That must have been the trays that they take a picture of and tell you guys that's what we're serving the inmates, because it's not. Um, I'm also here to talk about the dangers of Suboxone Pass. Under Sam HSA guidelines, a nurse and an officer shall be present when the Suboxone is passed. The nurse pops and rolls. The nurse has to give a Schedule Three narcotic like Tylenol-4. They have to crush it, make sure the inmate takes it and then swallows it, checks your mouth. Suboxone is also a Schedule Three drug. They're not staying. The county is paying sergeants overtime to make sure this is done, and they're saying, 
No, they leave, and you check their mouth. If you don't do it, you're going to get written up. None of us have been trained in the boxing pass. The major beta keeper told me that uh, it's not going to change until somebody tells them to. I'll go to the DEA. I don't care. They're the ones that are in charge of enforcement. Um, uniforms, like Officer Airmine said, uh, you know, uh, Steve had a great idea to get, ha get hand-me-down uniforms. We were actually able to help out one officer. Somebody gave him three uniforms. Like I said, we're losing half of our officers. The number one complaint is forced overtime, 80 hours a week. Number two, you got guys with one uniform working 16 hours a day. They got to run home and wash it, lose sleep, dry it, and then come back to work. Your time is up, Mr. Englert. It's just crazy. I have one more comment. Actually, your time is up, Mr. Englert. Thank you. Well, then I'll just pass out the report to the board. <clears throat> we'll now hear from, uh, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, but it appears to be Jonas Moffitt, Meffitt. That's your name? I thought your name was... That's okay. my maiden name. Okay. Moffitt, Moffitt right. Caballero. Okay. Thank you, sir. You have three minutes. In light of the recent press coverage around Judge Mariani, and the more than 60 misconduct complaints submitted to the Judicial Conduct Board around his improper and abusive behavior in the courtroom. I wanted to talk today about the judicial ethics as it pertains to this board. It was mentioned last month that Judge Housie received around 20% of his campaign contributions from Rich Fitzgerald. When viewed in light, of Judge Housie's continuous refusal to hold Mr. Fitzgerald to account when he rebuffs his statutorily required duty to show up to these meetings each and every month, and when Judge Housie refuses to allow a person to give public comment because they are two minutes late to the sign-up sheet, yet keeps shamefully silent when his biggest campaign contributor continuously fails in his duty to attend these meetings, it clearly shows a conflict of interest or at least the appearance of impropri impropriety on Judge Housie's part. So when you have a county executive who is a perpetual no-show to the jail oversight board, when you have an illegal proxy every month sitting in his place, when you have a judge who presides over these meetings whose entire role is obscured by one big conflict of interest, it's no wonder that our loved ones continue to die at the Allegheny County Jail at a rate higher than Rikers Island. It's no wonder that our community members are having their legs amputated at the Allegheny County Jail. It's no wonder that the incarcerated population are experiencing physical, sexual, and psychological abuse at the jail. And this is why we as tax dollars are so infuriated by the conduct and the inaction of this very board that's supposed to be going to, to bat for the people who are incarcerated at the jail. It's a goddamn shame. But I do want to thank Bethany Hallam, Council Member Hallam, for speaking truth to power and for being a voice for the voiceless on the inside. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your com comments, sir. Thank you. All right, we'll now hear from, uh, I believe this is Juana Sanders. Saunders, my apologies, Juana Saunders. Hello. Hello. Warren Harper, I know you believe that last the last meeting. Woo. Ms. Saunders, could I ask you to speak into the mic, please, Sorry. if you don't mind? Okay. Let me get this together. Warren Harper, I know you believe that the last meeting that you would never probably see me. But my name is Juana Saunders. I'm the mother of Gerald Thomas Jr. I will continue to be here until you're gone. Last meeting, you call all deaths in the jail tragic before continuing to deny having any responsibility for my son's death. You may not feel you are responsible, but any man who runs a jail in which medical care is not a priority has blood on his hands. Gerald's death is your fault. My son asked for medical care for three days before he passed up. This is not a natural death. The jail would like to claim that there's nothing natural about passing away on the floor of a jail after repeatedly denied, being denied you are, you are responsible. 
I ask if you are running a jail or a cemetery, and it is clear that you're attempting to do both. My son was not able to leave your jail alive, but I wonder even if he had received medical care, what would the care look like? The jail is critically understaffed and unable to provide medical care, so I doubt if anything would have been done for him. What does the medical care in Allegheny County Jail look like? Medical care at the Allegheny County Jail for Keyshawn Penny Baker looks like not receiving medical care after a double mastectomy. His incisions breaking open repeatedly after having healing, not healing properly. The jail still has not addressed this properly, nor have they addressed other medical issues unique to Keyshawn's transgender identity. This is a medical issue and it is a LGBTQIA rights issue in a community that I live in, Mr. Harper. Medical care for Kenya Harper look like losing a baby because she never received medical care that supported her high-risk pregnancy. She did not receive proper care during her mis miscarriage and was forced to bleed in a cell begging for medical help after the jail ignored her child's lack of a heartbeat for days. Warden Harper, how can you, as a man, run a jail that leads to a loss of a child with no remorse? You are a man. You are not a man I can respect. You don't, review, you don't view incarcerated people as humans being so human beings, so you do not care about keeping them safe, alive, safe and alive. Medical care for them is not a priority to you. This is a crisis. You have a responsibility to fight for the people in jail and this jail oversight board. Ms. Saunders, I apologize, but you are, you are far exceeded your three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll hear from Tanisha Long. Hello. Hello. Uh, I would like to say that this is meeting four of asking where Rich Fitzgerald is. Um, I would also like to address a comment by the warden at the last meeting where he patted himself on the back for having less deaths in the two, last two years. Um, I would like to say congratulations. You managed to kill less people when your jail is 30% less populated. The bar is so low, it's practically in hell. But moving on from that, um, I did some tabling outside of the Allegheny County Jail uh, several weeks ago. I talked to people who were coming out, people who had been locked down for 23 hours a day and only allowed one hour of recreational time. I'm not sure if you're aware of what that can do to a person's mental health, but it deteriorates it. To make matters worse, we've brought up uh, issues such as them not receiving books that their loved ones are sending, books about things like John Lewis, books about civil rights, uh, but then we find out that people on mental health pods aren't receiving the books their loved ones are sending at all. On top of that, those books are not being returned to sender, so where does that money go? Why are we taking money from them? When we talk about mental health, I also wonder, do we care about mental health in this jail? The board used to receive updates on how many people were waiting to receive mental health care or who were waiting to see, speak to a psychiatrist. That last report was in August of 2021. 321 people were waiting, and they were waiting an average of 32 days. Since then, we don't get those reports anymore. Those aren't subject to HIPAA, so there's no reason we shouldn't be receiving those numbers. I have a feeling that we don't receive those numbers because they're that bad. I have a feeling that this is something that we are now hiding, and I think that when we talk about mental care, we don't need just suicide numbers, because when a person passes away, that means we've already failed to provide that care. And just because a person didn't commit suicide, that does not mean that they are not mentally scarred for the rest of their life. A lot of time we talk about the health at the jail, and we're talking about the physical ways that we harm people, but the mental health issue it's far beyond that because you can spot a physical issue. You cannot track a mental health issue until it's already beginning to be too late. We owe the people inside there better. And Warden Harper, I, I'm embarrassed for you. I'm embarrassed that you would make comments like all deaths are tragic and we've killed less people when there's less people to kill. That's, that's, not, that's not something you should pat yourself on the back for. It's embarrassing. Thank you.
Thank you. We'll now hear from Carolyn Williams. Hello. Good evening. Well, I have nothing written. I just come to stand for, for you and your need. <sighs> for Sanders, I stand here for. I have a son, Maurice Williams, <laughs> that's incarcerated. Thank you for trying to help my son. You always did. <sighs> but he is in there, and he's telling me how he's eating. How they had him... <laughs> in a room for 23 hours mentally what do you think that do to a child I shake while I talk all I want to happen in this jail is for you to know there's human beings in there they made wrong decisions maybe I had a son, Marquise Williams, that was incarcerated. He had a mental issue. No one listened to me. And he was in there. No one listened to him when he said something's wrong. I had to keep calling the jail, keep calling the jail, keep calling. Ooh, Heavenly Father. No one listened. When I told them something was wrong with my son, he wasn't on his medication, but I fought, and I fought. I went over y'all head in that jail, because no one listened. I got him out right now, but he's still mentally fighting, because being in there, incarcerated, 24, 23 hours a day, that no one understood my son had mental. And he came out even worse as he went in. So I'm saying to you, Heavenly Father, <laughs> listen to these kids. They need help, and you're not helping them. You're not helping them. Listen to them. Feed them right. They eat bologna sandwiches that is green. Do you hear me? Would you eat that? <laughs> I'm not saying. Sometimes something ain't wrong with them, but y'all not listening. And something's wrong mentally, and y'all make them even worse by not listening. So I'm telling you, do better. I know you got to have a heart. Do you not? Oh, Heavenly Father. I tell you, listen. Help these kids, my... Oh, help them. I tell you, listen, they need help. And that's all I came to say. And I'm so sorry, honey. I'm so sorry for your loss. But I'm saying, save these kids. Listen, they need help. And you're not helping them in this jail. Everybody don't deserve this. Everybody don't deserve this. Y'all made mistakes. They don't even learn in there. How do you expect them to come out to do better? They don't have books. How do you expect them to learn to do better? Thank, thank you, Ms. Williams. You were seated. Amen. Your time. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Last but not least, we're going to hear from Marion Dummick. She's tiny. I think we, we might need you to be in front of the mic. I think I can talk loud enough. Can you hear me? I do hear you, but the, the gentleman can. needs to have you. He needs to have you on the mic, ma'am. Well, I can move this over. Okay, cool. Go. All right. All right. All right. I'm here. I'm here today, this time, for myself. For You're right. I'm, I apologize. I'll get to you. My apologies. I'm sorry. No, I was talking. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm here for something. It may sound frivolous, but it frankly isn't, because I'm thinking, sort of representing people of Allegheny County, including every one of you who presumably, I think, in order to work for the Allegheny County, you have to live here. All right. You all pay taxes. I pay taxes, too. Uh, we all do, I hope. All right. The county, in 2017, 
lost a case, or they, the case was filed in 2017 against the county jail for what, for tra how they treat transgender men, male and female, how they treat them badly, as you might have expected. $300,000 is what has been now the county is to pay. Who pays that 300000 All of us. All of our taxes pay that 300000 I don't want to pay it. I mean, I don't think any of us should pay it because of one reason, and that is, and no really organization or, con or business would work this way. If they have a 300000 or $5 million or whatever fee to pay, they would look at the person who caused it, and either he or she would be out or would be somehow punished. You have warden, this is my jail, Harper, who was responsible for how these people were treated, how they were, and what happened in the jail. I am asking you, is that reasonable? Should we all be paying for what he did wrong? knowing that the, that the law, four years before he did it, said, the federal law said that that wasn't to be done that way, people were not, transgender were not to be tra treated that way. We are paying for his offense, and he is <clears throat> paying what we pay, and that's it. Sounds fair, then I mean, I'm serious. I want I, my tax money to go to improve the country, the county. I want it to go where it should go. It's not going to the jail to see how transgender are used, how they treat people on suicide, how they, what they're doing, and all the ones that you've heard just before me. That isn't what you're doing, and the people who should pay attention to that are all of you, including, and I know that Ms. the one from the county, she's been very adamant on it. But I would say one of your members who is being represented, Mr. Fitzgerald, he's responsible too. And I want to say that. Uh, okay, I've, I've given it. you, yes ma'am, I've given you I'm finished. far past your three minutes. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. My apologies, Jody Lincoln. I uh, missed you on the list. My apologies. Hi, before I get to my main point, I just want to say how horrifying it is that this board and the Allegheny County staff hear from mothers and loved ones month after month for years about their family and loved ones' deaths and horrible medical and mental health mistreatment at the Allegheny County Jail, and we have seen no improvement and no changes for years. Something needs to change. Anyways, um, I'm a member of the Pittsburgh Prison Book Project, um, formerly known as uh, Bookum, which sends free reading and educational materials to people incarcerated in PA. Um, I've previously spoken to this board about trying to expand the options for people to get books into the jail. Um, currently working with Bethany Hallam on revisiting that conversation and hope to have you know, a proposal for you in a few months uh, working with the DOC. Um, however, the main goal of my comment today is to address the current censorship of books that people are allowed to receive at the Allegheny County Jail, um, how books are screened for content. There was a public comment from a family member in April, uh, concerned that books were being rejected, mysteries, nonfictions, book by blacks authors, and it wasn't clear why. While the published guidelines that the ACJ has online are in line with industry standards, the jail is not following best practices and recommendations when it comes to making decisions about what books are allowed. Across the country, we see 
poor book screening and censorship policies disproportionately ban books by and about black people and critical of the criminal justice system. I have a series of questions and recommendations regarding these book screening policies. First off, who is making these decisions about what books are acceptable? Is it a single individual in the mailroom? Does the mailroom flag books and send it to somewhere else to review? What happens to the books once it's rejected? Best practices are that, book, are that books should be returned to sender and a notice that includes the sender's information, title and author should be given to the intended recipient. Additionally, both parties should receive information about why the book was rejected and the appeal process. Speaking of, is there an appeal process? Especially if there's a single person making the decision, initial decision, there should be a way for either party to appeal the rejection and have it reviewed by a larger group. Um, you can see in the PADOC's denied publication that most of the books appealed by parties after an original rejection are then accepted by the larger group. And um, for transparency, it's extremely important for these processes. Um, all the above steps need to be clearly made public to the board and to the public and to the incarcerated individuals, but there also needs to be transparency about what books are rejected and more clarity about what defines a safety and security security issue. Um, that term is specifically is extremely wishy-washy and has been used across the country and by many correctional institutions to disproportionately screen books that are critical about the criminal justice system, books about black liberation and white supremacy. Um, so in closing, I hope the Jail Oversight Board will take this seriously and help the warden implement a better book policy across the board. Happy to offer my services and have a large net national network of experts in this that I would, you know, help make available to create that policy. Thank Thanks. you very much for your comments. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon me? If that's the last one, I have a question that I want to ask just about. Somebody has a hand. Oh, okay. No, your address isn't down. So, I mean, we don't allow people. There's no requirement anywhere that says your address must be written on a piece of paper. His name is signed in and he was signed in in time. Actually, there is. Where? Because you have to ensure that people live in Allegheny County. So, I didn't make But he can, he can prove that to you right now. You want to run a meeting? I would love to run the meeting, yes, please. Honestly. So, Mr. Gray. Come on up and speak, but in the future, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, need you need to put your address down. So I need you to do that before you speak. Okay. Call as well. Sir, I don't know, you're raising your hand, but if you intend to speak, you missed the uh, sign up period, it's too late. I signed up, but I didn't give my address. Well, I read all these names at the beginning of the meeting, and I said, if you did not sign, where's your, what is your name? Paul. Paul Flint? Oh, yeah. I read that name and I said if you didn't, at the beginning of the meeting, I said if you did not sign up, you would not be able to speak, so make sure you sign up. I read your name. And, yeah, but, but we can't do this. This is a process in place and then people don't sign up and then we have to delay the meeting. Come on, Mr. Gray. Come on, Mr. Gray. Mr. F uh, Flint, this will be the last time I do this. If you do not sign up, you can't speak. Sure. <laughs> Judge Halsey, while he's signing up, to be fair, you had said that people had to sign up before the meeting started. You had said uh, nothing about addresses. All, you, all that needs to be proven is that they are residents. As long as their name is on the list by the start of the meeting, what I said they are was, able to speak. Were, I read every name that did not have an address, and I said their addresses need to be listed. That is what I said. That is not the policy for public comment. Actually, it is. Actually, I'm on a legislative body, and I actually know what the requirements are to Thank give you. a public comment. Thank you, Ms. Allen. You're welcome. All right, you got your address on there? Thank you. Mr. Gray, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by uh, reading the definition for the word ethics, moral principles that govern a person's behavior for conducting an activity. Interestingly enough, my uh, union president, Mr. Englert there, touched on we get written up all the time for code of ethics violations. You know, as I've uh, sat through this meeting, uh, something I find interesting is we're constantly being written up by people that don't show a high amount of ethics. Um, talking about you guys going through the minutes, arguing about who who's supposed to be here and who's talking. Um, the next thing I'd like to say is about the word respect, 
because that's very important in the jail environment for uh, officers, inmate relations. Respect, by definition, is a feeling of admiration for somebody, for the qualities that they have in life. Same thing as we sit here and talk about all the things going wrong with this jail. I don't see a lot of things to admire in my administration that I work for, um, and that's very sad. I'm hoping that you guys as a board can do some things to make changes, to make it better for both my fellow officers, myself, and the inmates alike. Um, I've watched a couple of these meetings online from working in there, I haven't seen a large amount of changes within the facility, and that's very sad. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Fluid. Fluid? Yes. Uh, I def definitely appreciate you guys letting me speak today. Um, I just want get, to um, get to uh, basically speak about what transpired on the 21st of May um, with my wife. Um, practically, she was incarcerated for a 72-hour hold. Um, she was placed in the hold for a 72-hour hold for missing a court date. Um, she was put, um, and to let you know that she was postpartum, she just had a, uh, a baby. We just had a baby um, not long ago, and on the 16th of, um, of May. Um, when she was <laughs> on the 72-hour hold, um, she got processed as if, if she had had new charges or whatever. They processed her through the jail and let you know she was postpartum. Um, when she got into the jail, they treated her like as if she was nothing. You know what I'm saying? They basically um, um, had um, not gave her her medical attention like she's supposed to have gotten. Being, her, being that she's postpartum, um, she was basically placed into um, a, holding, a holding cell um, I, I can't really give details of what she knows. She probably will have to speak next time to tell you, give full detail. But uh, she's on a 72-hour hold, and she got processed as if she was, you know, had new charges. Um, it was brought to the attention to the warden. Um, she basically had to write the warden herself personally, who came to her cell, and who, um, I guess, assuming that he didn't know too much about the incident, um, they basically clapped her veins. Um, she had uh, still pieces of the placenta still in her system. Um, they found uh, pieces of the placenta in her still after the hospital left the placenta in her for over two hours. Um, she basically went through a lot while she was in there. And um, I think that the, the, you know, the board should look into how things are processed through there. You know what I mean? Because as a postpartum I'm female, I don't know what it'd be like to be postpartum, I'm not female, but I mean, I can imagine the emotional trauma that she's been through while she was in there. She said that they was basically treating her like she was like, you know, on, in other words, poop. Um, I just think that the board should look into how the processes of inmates when they come in there, you know what I'm saying, they should look over that because I feel that she should have never been in there, you know what I'm saying, for that, and she spent, let you know, she spent five days in, in this jail when she was only on the 72 hour hold. And she was promised that she wasn't going to jail, but um, Judge, uh, what was his name? Judge Todd. Judge Todd refused to see her, you know what I'm saying? And basically promised that she wasn't going to go to jail. And she almost pretty much died in there, died in there. And if it wasn't for, you know, the, you know, the pressure from the outside of the jail letting them know what she was, her conditions were. Um, the warden, um, you know, uh, certain staff members would have not have known, you know what I'm saying? And she could have passed in there, you know what I'm saying? Um, being that she just delivered a baby on the 16th of that month, you know what I'm saying? So I just basically need to know, um, let the board know that there's got to be some changes throughout the jail and the conditions of the jail. Um, you know, they're putting inmates in sub-zero cells that have, you know, they don't have no, no blankets, no pillows, no nothing. They are sleeping on hard metal, hard, uh, you know, you know, uh, cement floors, and they're not getting the attention that they need. And um, I think that the board should look into that, and um, look into what she she has been through while she was in there. My thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, 
I have a question about public comment. So usually uh, for these meetings, we get a copy of the online public comments, but I noticed in our meeting material that we didn't get those this month. Why was that? Because of the public comments submitted. Do you know why that was? Because I do know. It was because the court website never updated for the July meeting, so the public comment period never opened for this meeting. She had brought that to my attention. I, I found out two days ago when someone went to put in a public comment and it still said June. That's not my, it's, it's the court's website. If you would like me to house the, the website on my own, I mean, I'll do that if that's what it takes to make sure that it has access. I mean, it's not funny. We, we agreed as a board that we would continue accepting online public comments and that they would just not be read into the meeting. For this meeting, zero online public comments were accepted. They were closed to the public. The website was not even updated for this July meeting. If you go on it right now, it still says the June meeting and the public comment period is closed. That has never happened as long as I've been on this board. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. Ms. Hallam, I, with, all, with all due respect, Judge Halsey doesn't take care of the website or any of the technology of the court that would do that. So if, if somebody wants to make public comments, they should really alert us so that we can get it fixed. Because, you know, I, I'm quite sure that Judge Halsey didn't know, I didn't know, and whether it's, a, it may be the court's website, but like we don't have responsibility for that, but we would love to get it fixed. We just need somebody to inform us so that we can get it fixed because it's important that the public be able to do the comments. But if we don't know, we can't fix it. Yeah, I only found out after the comment period was about to end anyway, so I figured I'd bring it to the attention of the full board here. But I've just never seen that happening, so I'm wondering where the disconnect was well, and, and where is that responsibility lie? There, there's, there's an awful lot of, um, been a lot of court technical issues right now, um, not just with the website, but with a whole lot of other things. I mean, you know, we, we don't have a printer that works in our courtroom for a while, so there, there are issues. But if, if you let us know, we'll try to make sure that we get it to the help desk and get that fixed. Okay, yeah, can, I guess I'll just let the court's representatives know now that can we make sure, you know, whatever it is, a certain amount ahead of time, that it's updated. So like when the June board meeting ends, it should have been July. When the July board meeting ends, it should be leading up to August. So thank you. I just want to say, I apologize to anyone that did not have an opportunity to submit public comments. I was unaware of the technical difficulties associated with the website, so I do apologize for any inconvenience that has caused. Warden Harper, would you like to give your report? Thank you, Your Honor. The first thing that I would like to do is correct the false narrative and the incorrect data that's been presented to this board pertaining to deaths at the Allegheny County Jail. I stand by my statement that I made last month that deaths at the Allegheny County Jail is significantly lower than the national average. And what we did was we did an analysis that Chief Deputy Warden Toma is going to present to the board to show that our deaths are significantly lower. So that's the first thing that I would like to report to the board. Secondly, with consultation with the Allegheny Health Network and the Health Department on Wednesday, June the 29th, 2022, we lifted the mask mandate for employees and incarcerated individuals. Employees and incarcerated individuals have the option to wear the mask with the exception of certain areas in the jail, such as intake, our medical units, our intake units, and during all health encounters. Also, a board, we are still providing split recreation for incarcerated individuals, and we're trying to provide them as much out of cell time as possible. But to ensure the safety of all, we're gonna evaluate whether or not the COVID cases go up. And if the COVID cases remain low, we will move to full recreation. Your Honor, that's all I have for the board. Any questions? <laughs> um, I, I actually wanted to know about the staffing issue on 5F. You know, staffing. If, if, there, if there is only one uh, officer there when there has traditionally been two, and if there is going to be a second officer added. Your Honor, I. I I would really like to talk about any staffing issues not in this public setting. If, please. 
then perhaps we can have a telephone call Absolutely. about the staffing issue yes, on 5F and yes, what the deal is. Because, Anytime you're ready. You know, obviously it, it's an issue if they're saying that there should be two and there's only one and people aren't getting the appropriate care and supervision up there. Your Honor, I will meet with you anytime you're ready to meet to discuss that issue, but not just in this public setting, ma'am. Okay. Yes, I have a few for you. Um, so first of all, I just like uh, to say again that you cannot just say that everything is a safety issue and that it has to be talked about in an executive session. You are abusing and completely misinterpreting the intent of the Sunshine Act. It doesn't, like you just can't do that. So hopefully we will reinforce that sometime soon and get those answers. Because I would also like to know, if we're hearing about things in a public meeting, in a public setting, I would like to hear about them from you also. Because right now, all anyone knows is that there's not adequate staffing on 5F. Because that's all we heard about today. If everybody else has questions about that, maybe we can add that to our executive session. I would, well, and, I and definitely want to do that there, but it should be done in this meeting. That is the purpose of this meeting. You could sit here and say everything's executive session, which you try to do, but this definitely is something we get the list of the healthcare staff vacancies. Why aren't we hearing about correction officer vacancies? Look at all these folks who aren't working right now and came here to talk about their job. I would never talk about my work when I wasn't on the clock. Look at all these people that came out. It's more and more every single month. They're in danger every single day because we can't talk about it in a public meeting and address it in a public meeting. Because in the executive session, there's zero accountability. So I would like to hear about that here. But I'll get to my questions. Um, my first question is about the, um, what was it called, reimagining the county jail. There was an RFP that went out. I was wondering if you could give me an update on that RFP. I cannot at this time. I have to do a little bit more research to be able to provide information to you at a later date, ma'am. Okay, um, and then the, the uh, RFP that was put out for the commissary vendor, can we, the full board receive a copy of the RFP that was put out? Uh, Ms. Hallam, the only way that anybody would be able to have access to that RFP is to register through Bonfire to have access to that RFP. Okay, I understand that that is the situation currently. I am requesting that you provide that to the full board instead of us having to register a bonfire account because I've attempted to do that before and it's not the easiest thing in the world. I will look to see if I can do that, ma'am. I'm sorry, Warden Harper, do you, have, do you have access to the RFP for the commissary provider? So the jail is not the final publisher of an RFP. It actually comes out of purchasing. That's why it goes to there. So we can make that request to purchasing for that document. For so you currently do not have a we copy of it? We are the publisher. I understand so. that, but I'm not asking who the publisher is. I'm yeah. asking the of jail. The final, who has a of the version that was posted to the website, we will have to get that from purchasing and we will provide that. So you do not have access to the RFP for the commissary provider? For pur through purchasing, we do. Okay, so you do have access to it? Through purchasing. So I'm asking you to give it yes. all to us, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, the next thing is, Warden Harper, can you speak to, was there any time in the past few months since the temperature has been heating up outside that any area of the jail has been without air conditioning? We've had some areas within the jail, just like in homes, that have maintenance issues. So when we are advised of any maintenance issues to include air conditioning, we notify our maintenance department to resolve the issue. And on average, what's the average period of time that you're waiting for that maintenance issue to be resolved? I don't have that information as to average time. Okay, on average, how many times would you say in the past few months that a section of the jail has been without air conditioning for any given time? I do not have that information. Is it five, is it 20, is it 100? I do not have that information. Okay, I would like you to bring that information to us. If there is a maintenance request that is submitted, then there is a documentation of those breakdowns of air conditioning. I would like that to be provided to the board. Got that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, um, then my next question is about, uh, we had a public comment tonight about books, and you know I've been doing some work around that, and so I have a couple questions. Who makes the decisions about what books will and will not be allowed into the jail? 
right now, our mail department makes that determination as to what books are allowed in the jail. And is there an individual within the mail department? Is every employee of the mail department collectively coming together to make that decision? How are those folks decided? If there's, there's three mailroom individuals that work in the, the mailroom at the jail, and each one of those employees have the capability of approving and denying books based on our policies and procedures. And after that one individual makes that determination, does it have to get approved by anyone else or can they unilaterally make that decision based off of your policies? They make that decision based off our policies. And once a book is rejected, what happens next? It is returned to the vendor. Okay, uh, so not to the sender, but to the vendor. It is returned to the vendor. Okay, and then what happens next? Nothing else happens. Okay, so there's no refunds given to the person who tried to send the book? I would think that the vendor would be responsible for sending the refund to the individual. Okay, does the jail give any notice to either the sender or the recipient that the book was refused, denied? Only if the sender makes a request to the mailroom department will the mailroom department give a reasoning why the book was returned to the vendor. And how is that request made to the mailroom department? They can uh, email and make telephone call. They can talk to the incarcerated individual. The incarcerated individual could put a request slip into the mailroom to let them know and get a response as to why the book was sent back. And is there a record keeping process for keeping track of all the books that are denied? Yes, it is. So does a record exist of every book that was denied and why? What's so funny? So there's a record of that a submission was denied, but not as to what the book was or the reason being. Also, I wanted to point out your statement in regards to um, is the person notified? One of the reasons a book could be denied is that the receipt, A, there's no receipt received with the book, or B, that receipt does not identify a sender. So there would be nobody for us to know who that sender was. So beyond the this, the reasons why books are denied that's posted on the Allegheny County Jail website, there are other, you know, there's also the fact that there's no receipt or there's no sender for us to correlate back to. Okay, and so when you, now, now back to the record, so what does the record say? Just this person, this recipient was denied a book and nothing else, or what does the record say? I, I can't speak to exactly what it is. We're not the individuals who enter it, but we can look into what it is. But as far as I know, it's just a record that states that uh, books were denied, but not as to any specific. Okay, so there's no record keeping as to which books have been denied in the jail? Not to the best of my knowledge. Okay, is there an appeals process for a book being denied? Not to the best of my knowledge. Okay, uh, do senders need to be approved to send books to the jail? No, senders do not need to be approved to send books. So why are books denied when the, a sender is not identified? The sen that's part of the policy is that a sender has to be identified that we're actually receiving it. So I, I, that is the policy. I can't speak to um, why that's the policy. I wasn't the author of it, but we do require a known person to be the sender. Okay, um, my next question is about, so we've talked before about how the money from the phone, like the profits received from phones and tablets or that money, where does that money go? Because it used to go into the incarcerated individuals welfare fund and I know that changed a few years back. So I'm just wondering where that money goes now. So the commissary has a commission rate that goes into the incarcerated person's fund in regards to the telephones Tele and anything for tablets, general fund. The general fund, okay. So it doesn't go into a specific area, it's just broadly thrown into the general fund? Any profit that the jail receipt check. Okay, and how much is made monthly on that on average? I could not tell you at this time. Okay, but is that does that record exist somewhere that that information could be given to us? I'm sure that it does since it's received collections. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I wasn't here when it switched from going from the welfare fund where the commissary commission goes to the general fund. Um, were you or Warden Harper that you could talk about why that switch happened? I don't know that 
I don't know anything about a switch from the MA Welfare Fund to the general fund. I thought it always went to the general fund. No, it didn't. They used to both be in the Incarcerated Individuals Welfare Fund and then the phone, this was pre-tablet days, but the phone calls and com commissary profits were separated. Commissary stayed in Incarcerated Individual Welfare Fund and the phone profits went to the general fund. We're gonna have to do some research into that, ma'am. Okay, yeah, I would appreciate you getting back to me on that. Ms. Allen, could you repeat the ask for that, please? Yeah, the ask for that is how much money is generated monthly from the profits from what is now phone calls and, and tablets? And two, um, why doesn't it go into the Incarcerated Individuals Welfare Fund? And, and, and Ms. Hallam, we had a discussion at one point in the IIWF about that. Mm -hmm. It's apparently a prior administration right. that changed that to help balance a budget, is my understanding. But I'm sure that somebody has better institutional knowledge yeah. can, uh, can give you more specifics. But I, I, I remember us having a discussion with uh, Ms. Paris about that. Yeah, I would love to talk to the county executive about it, but he doesn't come to the meetings. But he, you're right, he would probably have an idea. Well, I, I think it was the prior administration. Okay. Is what, is, what, is what I think we discussed, so just to jog your memory. Okay, I thought it was around 2014 was when that happened. And so that would be the current administration. Yeah. You think it was I, older I, than I that? I that. Okay, I'll check on that. Um, so additional questions that I have for you, Warden Harper, are about um, the booking fee. So I recently received information about how much money is generated from the booking fee. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about who is assessed that booking fee. Uh, and also, I only got the number of like how much has been made off of it. And I want to know specifically what it's used for. Um, so I can't speak to the initiator of the booking fee, but the, the revenue we received from the booking fee goes to pay for um, the correctional officers who work in those areas that applies to where the booking fee is received, so our intake area. So does that money go directly into a, a line item in a budget and in, in that those positions are only funded from that money or is it also broadly thrown into the general fund? No, it's actually earmarked specifically to that. It's its own account and we have um, a specific account for which those salaries are charged off. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then also, um, this might be a question for the next report, but if it is, please let me know. Um, but I know at previous meetings, the medical director had spoken with us, and I'm just wondering if that's something that could happen at another meeting, because we're talking a lot about healthcare. A lot of the public comments are surrounding around healthcare and lack of healthcare, and so I'm wondering if we could have a dialogue, the jail oversight board, with the medical director, or if they could come to this, these meetings. Uh, we will look into that, uh, Ms. Hallam. I cannot commit to that. We will look into that. Okay, appreciate that. Um, so my next question is, uh, the one benefit of having these jail oversight board meetings that fall a little bit later in the month is that we get the solitary confinement report before this meeting. So um, it, you had that the jail continued to be in a f full facility-wide lockdown throughout the month of June. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak as to why that was the case through the entire month of June, when on June 30th there were zero positive cases of COVID. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could speak to why the entire jail was locked down. If you remember on May the 2nd, we placed the jail on full recreation. Mm -hmm. And when we placed the jail on full recreation, almost 150 to 200 incarcerated individuals tested positive for COVID. So therefore, in order for us to get our COVID cases down, we had to return back to a lockdown and limit the amount of individuals coming out to bring us to where we are now. So we're gonna always make our decisions based on the safety and security of this facility. The, like I reported before, the cases are down, we remove the mask, they have the option, and we're gonna look into going to full recreation as soon as we evaluate whether our COVID cases go up or down. So is the jail on a full lockdown right now? The jail is on split recreation as we reported before and we're trying to give them as much out of cell time as possible as I reported during the report, warden's report. Right, and, and as you know, I firmly believe that the jail is not in compliance with the referendum and its reporting mechanism. Uh, you can say that's not true all you want, but just looking at this here, it says that there were no instances of persons in jail intake 
being isolated in a cell alone for more than 20 hours during the month of June. But if you remember, the referendum says nothing about being alone. It's that they need more than at least four hours a day out of their cell. So during the month of June, are you saying that every single person that came through intake was allowed out of their cell for at least four hours a day? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, and then also, I'd like to know, is there, throughout the rest of the jail, not in intake, the rest of the jail, the pods, how many people in the jail were not allowed out at least four hours a day of their cell? I think the report just stated, Ms. Howland, you just stated that the entire jail was on the lockdown, so the entire jail. The entire jail, gotcha. And the reason for that was COVID, because COVID numbers were up? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if COVID yes, numbers were up, um, and then by the end of the month there was zero, and you decided to go to vo voluntary mask wearing, has any of those numbers gone up? Right now they have. Oh, shaka, though. Right now they have not. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I only have one more question, and it is about, um, we had talked in previous meetings about you know, we as board members, and I know I'm not just speaking for myself, but are concerned about deaths in the jail. We hear continuously month after month, we have loved ones of people who lost their family members, lost their loved ones in the jail. Um, oftentimes we're told there was no foul play. It was a natural death. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't think it's natural when we have 26 year olds falling dead on the floor of the jail. Um, and so we have constantly been told that we do, as board members have no authority whatsoever to get information about these folks that have died in the jail. So I did a little bit of research, okay? And so I, I found instances of many, many other jail boards throughout this country who do oversight investigations of jail deaths. Just in 2022 alone, um, the Rikers Oversight Board, the Arlington County Board, the Denver Citizens Review Board, the Metro Council Public Safety Board, all of these are jail oversight boards, and all of those are instances of oversight boards conducting investigations into deaths inside their jail. So Warden Harper, I know um, that you said that investigations are conducted by the jail. Why is, is none of that information handed over to members of the jail board? Again, Ms. Howell, Mr. Biondo explained that to you at the last meeting. And if there's any information that you guys are requesting we cannot provide it because it's pending litigation. So the law department already told you that. So I'm just gonna go based on what the law department told the board last month. So to be clear, what the law department told us was that we, they, that we were not getting information, one, because of hypothetical potential pending litigation, not current pending litigation. And that is not allowed, that is not an exception. And two, we were told that it was because of HIPAA. And so I'm concerned because it seems that we are the only board that's not getting this information. So I'm wondering if you or Mr. Backrack would like to speak to, I would like information about every single person that has died in the jail. If, if the, an investigation is taking place, I would like to, us to find out about it. Not only would I like it, it is guaranteed to us by a state statute. Ms. Howland, we cannot provide that information due to pending litigation. So there, are, there is pending litigation on each and every death in the jail currently right now. As the law department, Mr. Biondo, stated last month, there may not be pending litigation at this time, but in the future it could be, so therefore we cannot give that information. Mr. So Backrack, I'm sorry, you were gonna, he was gonna say something. Yeah. Historically, most of these cases end up in litigation. So that's why we view it as pending litigation. We also think that it's prohibited by HIPAA. Okay, so um, first of all, has every single death in the jail, has there been a lawsuit about? Because you said historically. I didn't say every single one. Right. The, 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 a significant portion of them, I don't have the exact statistics, but a significant portion of them do end up. So we are not being given the information that we need to do our oversight job because you believe that because some lawsuits have been filed over previous jail deaths that therefore we sh can't get information for any of them? Am I understanding that? 
Okay, so I'm glad you brought up HIPAA because that was brought up by Mr. Biondo and so, you know, did a little research on that too. Uh, so there are exceptions to HIPAA, are you aware? Okay, do you know what those exceptions are? I could give you a laundry list of them. Okay, so I'll... I'll I'm not going to debate HIPAA. I'm not asking you to debate. I was actually asking Warden Harper, but since you're here, so there are... Well, Warden is a brilliant position to get legal advice, so... Well, I'm glad you're here then. Um, so there are two specific... I'm, I'm not going to debate HIPAA. Okay, I would just like to give you this information so you can take it back to the legal department then. Great, thank you. So two specific exceptions to HIPAA kind of caught my eye, right? Um, so the first exception is for law enforcement purposes, which we already know that is being followed because the county police are the ones who are investigating each and every jail death. Uh, so believe it or not, come to find out, we are law enforcement officers. Who knew? Uh, so by definition, a law enforcement officer is someone who is empowered by law, like we are by our state statute, to investigate or conduct an official inquiry into a potential violation of the law, which I would argue is what we're trying to do with the information with jail deaths. So now the next exception to HIPAA is for health oversight activities. And guess what? We are also a health oversight agency. Uh, so a health oversight agency is any agency or, or authority, including the employees or agents of such public agency or its contractors or persons or entities to whom it has granted authority that is authorized by law to oversee a health care system. There is a health care system within the Allegheny County Jail, supposedly. Supposedly we're providing health care. Supposedly we're providing mental health care. So what I would like to know, and I understand that that's not something you want to discuss right now, but that information could be gathered and brought back to this board, is why, since we are exempted from HIPAA, why we are not being given information about each and every jail death that is not currently under pending litigation. I have talked to many lawyers who said the potential for a hypothetical lawsuit is no excuse to denying information. I, I heard what you said. Okay, and then I also wanted to clarify for other members of the board, um, as well as Warden Harper and his team and Mr. Backrack, um, we've talked a lot about the state statute that governs us as a jail board and the authorities that we are given. And I'd like to remind everybody while I'm reading this that where it says shall, the law says that that means must, okay? Not just if you want to. Uh, so under section uh, 1724, so this is Title 61, is what the law is that governs state statutes I've forwarded along many of times. Um, so, um, Subsection A says that our administrative duties and powers shall include the oversight of the health and safe keep keeping of incarcerated folks, shall ensure that the jail is being operated in accordance with its regulations and the laws and regulations of this commonwealth in the United States, and last, and this is the really, really interesting one, the board shall investigate allegations of inadequate prison conditions and improper practices occurring within the prison and may make such other investigations or reviews of prison operating operation and maintenance the books papers and records of the prison including but not limited to the papers and records of the warden and those relating to individual incarcerated individuals shall at all times be available for inspection by the board. So uh, it, that seems pretty clear that we are to have access to anything that the jail has access to. It is how we do our job. Uh, so could you answer to your interpretation of the statute? Have you read this statute before, Mr. Baccarat? I've read it. And, and so you, you agree that this is what these subsections say, the language that I just read? I believe you read it correctly, yes. Yeah. And so can you please explain to us why we are constantly being denied access to the papers and records of the warden and those relating to individual incarcerated individuals? We can, uh, I, I don't think you have been uh, denied records that you are entitled to. 
I would, I have multiple times asked for records requesting to Mr. Gerald Thomas's death. I would like to know, we have had his mother come now for two meetings in a row. She has been seeking answers as well. And we as the board don't even have those answers. So if that's something that is readily available to me, then please provide to not just myself, but the other board members, any documentation relating to any person who has died in the jail, I would say going back two years. We uh, believe that what's been provided is what's uh, allowed. Have you ever seen what's been provided to us after a death in the jail, Mr. Backrack? Um, have I seen it? No. Okay, because I'll, I'll tell you, since you said that what we've been provided is all that there is to be provided, we get an email, sometimes a copy and pasted email where the information hasn't even been changed from the last person who died in the jail, that says, FYI, someone died in the jail on this day at this time. That's all. I understand you don't get the medical records from the jail. No, I don't get anything other than sometimes an email. And sometimes we even have the privilege of finding out from the press, from loved ones, from other people incarcerated, from staff members at the jail that someone died at the jail. Just so as a point of order, because I, I, I am agreeing with you that I think that we are a jail oversight board, mm -hmm. so we do need to have some more oversight. I don't think that the exact logistics of what we are able to access and not access are going to be accomplished in this meeting. So I just want to suggest that that is something that we come prepared in detail with to an executive session. Mm -mm. You want to do that in public? No, I want to know that the information will be given to us. I want a commitment on the record that that information will be given to us going forward. Well, it doesn't sound like Mr. Backrack has all the information, even if he doesn't even realize that all we're getting is an email. Okay, then that's what I would like to request. I appreciate that, Controller Royston. So I think. I also realize that you're not getting other records. Right. So we need to clarify exactly, you know, by law, what we can get and then make a point of requesting that moving forward. Okay. So, Mr. Backrack, can we ask you then what the proper procedure is to uh, go about requesting that for a future meeting? Um, I'm not even sure. Who would you like me to reach out to to clarify more information being provided about deaths in the jail to this board? The warden's right here. I, I'm, I'm not going to debate it though. I mean, I, you wanted to know, you could write to. That's who I think you can write. Okay, so you think Warden Harper is the person I should talk to about this? No, I said, I said Warden Harper, you can write Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Can I, I say so, Yes. There's quite a few things here that I've heard today that has been discussed. And we keep, you know, we're saying that we're going to have an executive session. But I think by the time we have our next meeting, that we should have a meeting to discuss these things that have been given here today and try to get some clarity because it, it can't happen right now. There's too much. And so maybe since we're having executive this, this session, I don't know, you know when that's gonna be, that some of these items, because I wrote down quite a bit, that we can, talk about this and when we come back give some answers to the public and have some satisfaction for ourselves. I agree and I you know as I had suggested I have been writing down all the actionable items both yeah. for Warden Harper and for the board and so I'll be happy to put those in an email okay. by tomorrow um, and then hopefully if everybody responds and Judge Halsey if you could um, find out when people are available to have that session. I think it would be good to do it sooner rather than later. Yes. So we have that, that information available for the August meeting. Yes. Us. And so we're agreeing that we will request that information as a board before the August meeting so we can get that information at the August meeting? Yes, okay. so we can Great. get some answers. Great, thank you. So I'm done with Warden Harper. I'll reserve the rest of my questions for the next report. Can I just there. ask one question of the warden? Is, is it possible to add to the information that we get before the meetings? You know, before we were getting the number of people waiting for mental health treatment, how many are waiting to see a psychiatrist? How many are waiting to see, 
can we add that back in? Because we, we haven't been, I guess, having that. So if we can add that back in. I know we had it at one point because I remember when we got it during COVID. Um, so if we could just add that information back into our reports, that would be helpful. So what exactly are you looking for, Yana? Um, number of people that... Number of people that have requested mental health services and um, when they... What's the average wait time? How many people are still waiting? Yeah. And Jess was there... Just, if to, I, just to see what kind of backlog there is. If I could jump in, I actually had that down for the next set of questions. So the things that we used to get um, were the number of people waiting for mental health specialists, the number of sick calls, and the number of people waiting for a psychologist. So, and the average wait times of waiting for each of those things. Any additional questions? All right, well now I have uh, the Chief Deputy Warren's report. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon again, Board. So on Friday, June 24th, the Allegheny County Jail Training Academy graduated eight cadets as full-time corrections officers. They were placed on schedule on Sunday, June 26th. Two days ago on Tuesday, July 5th, we began a new academy class consisting of 19 cadets. They are scheduled to graduate on September 9th. Over the next two weeks, we have six sessions scheduled for uh, continuing our hiring process to complete the physical agility test. So the next two, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at 0800 in the morning, we'll be conducting uh, the PT test at the facility. Okay. Uh, is there any questions on that before I go on? I just have a question. Um, how do you keep track of from each academy class uh, how many people like fall off? You know, like from the beginning of the recruitment process, you get a class of 20. By the, how many of those people actually end up working as corrections officers in the jail? Are you asking from the time they apply? From the time that they start the academy. I'm sure that the jail HR has that information. Okay, because I, I'm just concerned, you know, if we're talking about staffing issues that we're hearing that, okay, we're recruiting these people, but how many actually follow through? And then once they start working at the jail, I'd like us to know how long they stay. Are these folks who are coming working for two months and then leaving, is that why we have so many vacancies? Are they, you know, is there a consistent issue why folks aren't making it through the academy? I, I'm kind of trying for us to get a grasp on the staffing issue on the corrections officer side. I know, you know, we talk a lot about the healthcare staffing vacancies, but also on the corrections officer side, I'm trying to figure out where that disconnect is, why we aren't filling positions. Sure, you have to consider too that the size of the classes that we've had prior to this, they've been you know less than 10. So when we graduate those individuals, they go on a schedule, but we still have we still have officers retiring, you know, resigning to go to other employment, whatever it may be. So for us to get up to our full complement, we're we're always fighting that uphill battle. So in your opinion, what could we do to increase the number of folks who are coming on board? We've we've taken initiatives to streamline the hiring process uh, to get them to the academy. Uh, I'm, we're open to suggestions. Okay. Uh, it's no, thank you very much. You know. Uh, an update on the installation of the uh, suicide resistant cells. Uh, last time I reported out to the board two months ago, we were sitting at seven of 10 completed. We are still at that point. Uh, the, the three remaining doors to the cells that are not complete were reinstalled yesterday. So we're waiting for, uh, we're waiting for an ETA from the vendor to, to report to the facility to finish those. So I'm hopeful before the next board meeting, we can report that all 10 are complete and available for use if needed. So. That's all I have, sir. Who's doing the other reports under the chief deputy? You are? DHSA Madden. So if I have questions about medical treatment, who should I direct that to? Oh, I'm sorry. Is that a you question or? Well, yeah, Tuma has to report our presentation. Then we're gonna go to the next Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna speak to the jail's mortality rate as it was um, discussed earlier by the warden. Um, with three loss of lives in 2019, based on the annual number of admissions um, of the population, um, based on the average rate against 100,000 people, the mortality rate was 19. Um, the 2019 value that was reported by uh, the U.S. Department Bureau of Justice Systems was 179 individuals over 100,000. So that's 10 times less than what was reported um, by the Bureau of Justice. For 2020, we had three loss of life um, over our population of an extrapolated over 100,000 people was a result of a mortality rate of 34. 
um, which results in five times less than what was reported for 2019. That's our 2020 number. And in 2021, we had six loss of life um, based on our annual admissions, over 100,000 people, it was 65 uh, mortality rate, which is three times less of that was what recorded, which was again, 179 per 100,000 people that was reported per the justice uh, report. Can we get a copy of that report? Yeah, I'll email. I'll be happy to email you from the justice site. Please, thank you very much. And this was an analysis that you compiled with jail's data and compared with what statistics? So the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Statistics issued the mortality in local jails 2000 to 2019 statistical um, table report. That reported out the uh, mortality rates for jails. Um, and that was the number that was referenced earlier in this meeting. Um, we did our review of our rates, our mortality rates based on the annual population, admitted population. Okay, and are you counting um, the deaths of in this count that you're using to analyze these numbers? Are you counting the folks who were officially declared, declared deceased after leaving the jail and being in the hospital? We use the same definition that was in this report, which was custody. Okay, so if someone has a medical emergency in the jail, goes to the hospital, dies in the hospital, are they counted in this report right here? If they were still in the legal custody of the jail, as is the definition in this report, we use the same definition. Okay, so are you aware that regardless of if they are technically, by legal definition, still in custody, that the Federal uh, Bureau Death and, and Custody Reporting Act still requires that you count them even if you relinquish custody of them? If the if but for the medical emergency, they would still be incarcerated? It's, it's literally the first FAQ on the Death in Custody Reporting Act, which is a federal law, federal law. I'll review the methodology for which was published under this report to see what definition they refer to. Okay, I appreciate that very much because that, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, is there more to your report or any questions should you should they be asked now? That was the end of that part of the end, then uh, Ms. Madden will speak to the COVID statistics and other healthcare relevant materials. Okay, I'll save them for you then. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I have the healthcare report um, on behalf of Dr. Brinkman this month. So for uh, COVID numbers for incarcerated individuals, the total amount of incarcerated individuals tested for COVID-19 during June of 2022 was 1,897. Of those, 24 or 1.7% were found to be positive. There are three incarcerated individuals presently positive in the facility with zero hospitalized from COVID-19. We have had an overall positivity rate of 4.1% at the Allegheny County Jail since the first diagnosed case of an incarcerated individual on April 6, 2020. For employees, throughout the pandemic, we have had 291 staff report positive results. We presently have six individuals who continue through, through their recovery process and have not yet returned to work. For vaccines, in total, the Allegheny County Jail has supported the vaccination of incarcerated individuals by providing 2,875 doses thus far. On site, we have stored Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, and we are continuously offering those. Last month, we reported that we had 592 individuals who had received their full series, and this month we have 655, or 42%, of incarcerated individuals with a full series, which is up 4% from last month. Uh, during the month of June, our infectious disease team conducted 180 vaccines during a four-day vaccine clinic. For uh, medications for opioid use disorder and the expansion of these efforts, the jail continues to provide medication-assisted treatment options, which include naltrexone and Vivitrol for the treatment of alcohol and opioid use disorder, and Suboxone and Sublocade for the treatment of opioid use disorder. For the month of June, there were 27 individuals prescribed oral naltrexone with one individual receiving the Vivitrol injection prior to community release. During the month of June, 124 individuals were treated with Suboxone and 19 individuals were treated with Sublocade. 
The jail continues its contract expansion with Tedisso, our community methadone provider, and we're uh, currently in the developmental stages of implementing the methadone continuation services for individuals who are currently receiving methadone in the community. Uh, we're very excited to be working with Tedisso and to have these services up and running as soon as possible. Um, Tedisso is working on filling some staffing positions. Seven of them have begun the onboarding process. Um, and like I said, we're excited for this expansion. For Torrance um, commitments and admissions, during the month of June, three patients were admitted and transferred to Torrance State Hospital. During the month of June, 11 new patients were committed to Torrance State Hospital. And there's currently 19 patients who are awaiting admission to Torrance State Hospital with the longest waiting time since March of 2022. Uh, so last month, we were asked to track the tier four and five data um, in the mental health tier system. So I'm able to present the tracking data that's currently available. Um, and just as a reminder, tier five includes, um, it's the, it's, uh, includes any patient who is actively suicidal or self-harming, um, where tier four would be a step down and it's um, any patient who is at imminent risk of harming themselves or others. So in the month of June, there was one individual that was identified as a tier five in the mental health tier system. And throughout the month of June, there were 11 unique individuals who are identified as a tier four. And then um, just to note the duration um, that the, a patient is on a tier will vary um, from as little as hours to days. Um, and that just depends on the patient. Oh, okay, I'll start. Um, thank you so much for that report. I have a couple questions. Um, so my first one is, are we still doing rapid testing of any of the incarcerated population, like an intake or anything like that? Yes, yep, there's still rapid testing done. Okay, and who gets the rapid testing? Um, everyone that comes into the facility. Okay. Um, and then after intake, does it ever happen again? Yeah, so then the patient would get tested around day seven or eight to kind of with a PCR test at that point. So then it, by the time we get results, it'll be about 10. Okay, thank you. Um, also, so thank you so much for the medication for opioid use disorder numbers. You know, I get real excited about that. Uh, so what I wanna ask is, it sounds like that number really is going up every month that we're getting more and more people on those medications. So that's great news. Are, um, can you speak to, as of right now, are we yet initiating that for anyone, or is it all people who come in with existing prescriptions? Yes, it's still continuations only. We're not doing any inductions yet. Okay, are we always continuing them on the same medication that they were on when they were outside of the jail, or is there ever a time where the medication, maybe they were on methadone and then we put them on sublocade, anything like that? Um, I think it would depend, but the, the point for eligibility would be that we have to verify their script um, and things like that. So it, as long as it's verified and they meet criteria, then it should be continued. Okay, great, I appreciate that very much. Um, I have another question about gender affirming care happening or not happening at the jail. So this is something that I know we, we've talked a lot about the housing of transgender incarcerated individuals, but I have talked to some folks in the jail, one person specifically lately, who has said that he has been trying to receive gender affirming care, continuation of his gender affirming care that he received before he was in jail, and that, um, that the provider at the jail actually said that they don't know how to provide gender affirming care and so I was just a little confused by that that was all the information I got so I was wondering um, if you could t speak to any gender affirming care that you provide whether it's um, you know medical needs or mental health needs to folks in the jail sure I mean just generally speaking I mean we do offer um, if patients are receiving hormone treatments like we we do offer that for patients for, for medical needs you mm -hmm. so that can happen um, what was the next part of your question? Um, really just any gender affirming care that's happening. Um, so aside from hormone treatments, is there any other kind of service that's offered? Um, I, I don't think there's really anything that's like set 
like standard, it would be patient specific. So you had mentioned mental health, depending on what that patient needs is what would be addressed. Okay, uh, so so you do have providers, because my next question was, was going to be, have you secured any medical professionals who do have experience in providing gender affirming care? So there are folks on the staff who have that experience? I, I can't answer that. I don't know all their backgrounds okay. exactly. All right, thank you very much. And that's all I have for you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your report. I have a question. When you say that, when you quote the number that are 100% vaccinated, does that include people who are eligible for boosters? Uh, so that would be anybody who has their full series. And that who would be over 50, that would say. Um, be the second booster. But the second, right, that but right. might have gotten the second booster. Yeah, so I mean, boosters are offered too, um, but the, I don't I did, don't have it differentiated between like just a full series or a full series plus a booster. I don't have that number differentiated in this report. And I hope they're still getting the bonus money for boosters mm -hmm. that they get for the regular, the first course vaccine. Yes, we are still issuing for every dose. Great. And I guess this isn't a question, I'm sorry to just give you a comment, but, uh, or it would have been helpful to have maybe someone from the county here about the decision to give up masks. I just, I'm terribly worried about that with the BA5 variant that they say is more transmissible. And Well, I'm just gonna say this to you, Ms. Klein. We did meet with AHN and the doctors at AHN right. and our health department. So together we came up with this plan. And like I stated before, our medical units, all health encounters, intake units and intake, individuals are required to wear those masks there and employees and inmates have the option. So if they want to wear the mask, they can still wear the mask. Well, I, I hope I'm wrong <laughs> with what I think is gonna happen. Warden, just, just, a, just a quick question. Um, the masks, are they required to wear the masks when they leave the jail and come to the court for cases? Because I, I don't know if it's just that every every single person I've had in front of me has had masks on. So I, I was sort of sort of surprised when you said that it was lifted. I don't know when it was lifted. Because our intake department is still under a masking mandate. The, the incarcerated individuals travel to the intake department where they're transported by the sheriff's department to the courthouse. So okay. they, that's why okay. they have the I, Yeah, I, I was just wondering, because every single person that's come into the courtroom has been masked. So. I just have one follow-up question. Did, did Jens remove the COVID dashboard off the website? No. Okay. It, it, did it move somewhere else? It's still on the website, ma'am. Okay. Um, before we start new business point of order, Judge Halsey. Um, so there are a couple things I wanna bring up before we get into the motions. Um, so first of all, I would like to address that there was an email that was circulated to the board of your intention to cancel the August jail oversight board meeting. Is that still your intention? Okay, so would like to first talk about that because you can't cancel the August meeting. Um, so again, going back to the state statute, which I, I hope that everyone has read by now, it is very, 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 very clear. Uh, uh, section 1727 that says that the jail oversight board has to meet once a month. So your email didn't say that you were rescheduling it for a different day. It said that you were just canceling it. So um, I, more than anyone, understands the importance of being here for the meetings. I've never missed a meeting. I've missed children's birthday parties. Uh, I've missed a lot of events to, for the obligation of being here. But be that as it may, be that as it may, um, I'll call the board members and as I began to do a roll call, I became aware that six of the nine board members had conflicts and issues that would um, lessen the likelihood that they'd be able to attend the meeting. So that was the first thing. But the other thing I would like to point out is, historically, the board has canceled, under, under uh, Judge McDaniel's uh, tenure, meetings were canceled during the entire summer from, I believe it was from June until September. So that was the practice under her tenure. And under Judge Cashman, meetings were canceled in the month of August and the month of December. 
So when I spoke to everyone and I learned that there will not be a quorum at the August meeting, I sent out an email indicating my intentions of canceling the meeting. Okay, and again, we I know we've talked before, just because things have been done wrong and in violation of state statutes in the past does not mean that we should continue illegal practices. Uh, if that is the case, which, you know, I wasn't called. I literally saw the email and you told me I talked to like four people and decided to cancel the meeting were your exact words to me. Um, and that conversation only happened like right after I saw the email and was confused as to why one individual member of this board thinks that they have the authority to cancel a jail oversight board meeting, first of all, but then second of all, why you thought not to just change the day if the true reason was that you didn't think we would reach a quorum. Because again, people indicated that there was no good day based on everyone's schedule. I did not contact you because I'd already determined that we would not have a quorum based upon the people that I've spoken with. So for those reasons, the meeting in August was canceled. But I mean, I, I looked at the statute and it does say that, the, that we are required to meet at least once monthly. So we would not be fulfilling our legal obligation if we do not meet in August. So, I wasn't contacted either, and I believe that just as the motion that I'm going to bring up um, should have been discussed publicly, that this should also be discussed publicly. Well, it's been discussed, and like I said, six of the nine members, I believe five of the nine members, uh, no, six of the nine members indicated that they had issues that impacted their ability to attend. There would not be a quorum. <clears throat> Given the history of canceling meetings in August and December, as well as canceling meetings during the entire summer and the fact that we would not have a quorum, that was a decision that I reached. Yes, Judge Lazare. Can, can we just move it to later in August when, when people might be back from vacation so that we can make sure that we satisfy our obligation and get it in? You know what? Everyone is here. If you clearly don't believe me, you think I'm lying, why don't you ask each member about their availability? I, I, I'll do that. Is Who was contacted about canceling the meeting? Not counting the email. Who up here was contacted about canceling the meeting? And okay. I asked Commander and was contacted, and I spoke with Mr. He Commander. never comes. How many of you people who, I'm oh, sorry, of my colleagues who raised their hands are not able to attend on the planned August meeting? I cannot. You cannot? No, I'm Mr. Polarski, you're not on this board, so your vote is irrelevant. Ms. Klein? I can't attend the fourth unless it's remote. Okay. And Sheriff Krause, you cannot attend unless it's remote, or you cannot attend that day at all. As okay, uh, Ms. Moss, if the meeting was remote, would you be able to attend? Meetings are not remote. Okay, and, and Judge Lazara, if the meeting was remote, would you be able to attend or are you unavailable at that time? I, I quite frankly don't recall at this point what's on my schedule for the okay. course, but it's, you know, I, I think I'm traveling to go pick up a kid at a camp, and so I probably will not be able to attend it remotely unless you're going to see me bouncing along a highway. So, so rather than um, you know, I was just saying we should have this discussion because if not all of the board was contacted, then I don't think that it's appropriate and it should be something that's discussed in public because we are required to have those meetings. There are tools that we can use like doodle polls and things like that to see when everyone is available. So I, I guess just for the purposes of this meeting, can we just say, um, you know, is everyone amenable to finding a different date so that we can fulfill our requirement for August? And, and can we all agree that we acknowledge that we cannot cancel the August meeting? We can reschedule it. I, I do not agree with that. Have you read the state statute? Meetings have been canceled for years. That, if, if, that someone, meeting. if someone, if someone, excuse about me, it. Judge Halsey, I'm speaking. If someone comes into your courtroom and says, but I've been doing this crime for years, I've never been caught. How could you arrest me now? What would you say? I would say the meetings have been canceled historically in August. People said they did not have any availability during the month. I did not contact the remaining three members because once I realized that six of the nine were unavailable, there was no quorum, there was no reason to contact the remaining members. Okay, I would also like to point out that that is a violation of the Sunshine Act. So uh, the Sunshine Act says that you can't deliberate or take official action on agency business unless it's in an open and public meeting. And so you just admitted that you made these phone calls and this decision outside of a public meeting, correct? Is there anything else? 
I would like you to answer that because no. again, I think this is a very appropriate time to remind the board too, you are not the chair of this board. There is no chair of this board. You are Judge Clark's designee. If you cannot attend, then Judge Clark can come. If Judge Clark cannot attend, she can assign another designee. You are not the chair. You cannot unilaterally decide to do anything, nothing. I mean, the fact that you even run these meetings every day, I, I have an issue with, but you are not the chair. And if you've read the statute, as I would hope the rest of my colleagues have, there is no chair of this board. If we decide to adopt bylaws for this board, then we can designate who a chair is. We can say it's this role, or we can have an election of a chair every year, however we want to do it. But as it stands, you are not the chair of this board, which brings me to my next point, which is that you told both myself and Acting Controller Royston that we were not allowed to add each one motion onto this agenda. Right. You also cannot do that. Any motions that have not been agreed upon and put on an uh, agenda by the next meeting will not be read as part of the... That's actually not part of the Roberts Rules of Order. As a point of order, if you're presented with a motion by a board member, you are required to present it in public. Is, mm -hmm. and, and so is, I do have my motion here, and I would like public discussion for is everybody. Is that inconsistent with what we've discussed in prior... It's not about it's what we discussed Roberts Rules of Order. order. It is a law. Finish. You are violating a law. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm done. Okay, since you're done, then I will proceed to introduce our motions. If Controller Royston, would you like to start? Sure. This is the third month that I've tried to get this motion on the agenda. Um, I have requested that we are have the ability to participate in meetings virtually. The reason for that being I missed two because I was traveling that I tried to warn beforehand. Missed other ones because of COVID. That is not my intention. I am fully committed to this board as I think that mostly everybody is. We do work in subcommittees in the meantime in the interim of these meetings. And I think our voices should be heard even if we're not to, uh, able to be here physically. So I presented this motion um, three months ago and I was told that conversations were held outside and nobody agreed with it and so it would not be put on the agenda. Um, I was not privy to those conversations and several people that I talked to were not privy to those conversations. Last month, admittedly, my office did get it in late and so we were not able to do that. I was told this month it was not going to go on the agenda because the logistics were unavailable, which is again something that should be brought up for public discussion and actually something that my office can easily do. So um, I can pass this out to the board if they want to see it, but my motion is that the, j and I actually amended it to only include two meetings because I, I realize that we don't want people to attend virtually all the time. That jail oversight board members should be allowed to attend meetings remotely through Microsoft Teams or by phone instead of strictly in person. There is no requirement prohibiting a virtual option in the statute or otherwise, and institution this op instituting this option will only increase participation by board members. This option should be limited with only two virtual options available per member per year. This is the same option that county council members and various other governing boards have as well. Uh, I also did find out that the software for this capability is completely free of charge. I'd like to second that motion. So we have a motion in a second. Um, any discussion? Any discussion on that? Hearing none, I'd like to take a roll call vote. Judge Lazara? I would, sorry. I, I would be in favor of that. Okay. Controller Royston? Yes. Ms. Klein? Yes. Ms. Moss? No. Mr. Polarski, who is voting illegally? No. Judge Halsey? No. Sheriff Krause? No. Remote meetings. I don't have a problem with it. So that's a yes? I would be okay with that. Absolutely. Okay, and I'm a yes as well. So we have one, two, three, four, five yeas, three nays, the motion passes. Um, I would like to now move on to the next motion that was denied being put on this agenda. Um, this was a motion that you all received in writing for the last meeting um, regarding the actual food, the deviations from the posted menu, um, taking feedback from folks who were not originally supportive of the motion last month. I decided that instead of asking within 24 hours to hear about a menu deviation, that we instead uh, just follow the existing jail policy, which I have right here. It's policy number 314. Four. 
Um, under procedures, number 11 says that an accurate record of all meals prepared will be maintained in the food service department. And under diets, number three, it says the manager will make certain that the food service plan is followed, that's the posted menu, and any substitutions will be documented. Variations from the plan may be allowed for holidays and weekends provided they meet all basic food nutritional standards. All menu substitutions shall be recorded. So since these substitutions are already recorded, I am simply asking that we, within 30 days of the end of the month, so hopefully at the next jail oversight board meeting or the following one after that, receive any menu deviation. So we already have the posted menu. Now we see this report that already exists that shows us what was served instead. So if it says on the menu they're getting meatloaf and they instead get bologna sandwiches, that's already documented. All I'm asking is that within 30 days we receive that report. So um, again, after hearing from my colleagues, I amended it to be not a short 24 hour notice. So I would like to make the motion to say that that actual plan of what menu substitutions were be given to this board each month. Um, and I would like to ask for a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, but Ms. Moss? I have a question. No, the, let me understand what you're proposing. Are you proposing that we get a menu of the food monthly? And if there's any deviation you want it told to us, monthly yes so the okay. the the scheduled menu is already posted okay. that's already given out and already they are documenting anytime they're deviating from it so all it says is that each month we'll get a report of the deviations okay, okay. I can go. okay. thank you any other discussion okay we have a motion and a second discussion has ended i will take a roll call vote judge lazara i would be in favor of that controller royston yes Ms. Klein? Yes. Ms. Moss? Yes. Mr. Polarski, voting illegally? Abstain. Judge Halsey? Opposed. What was that, sorry? I am opposed. You're no, okay, and Sheriff Krause? Yes. Okay, so the ayes have, oh, I'm also an aye, sorry. The ayes have five, the nays have two, with one abstention, did I count that right? One, two, is it six? No, I think it's six. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'm so sorry, I didn't vote, that's my own bad. So the ayes have six, the nays have one with one abstention, the motion passes, and now we will move on to the motions that were placed on the menu. Um, our first motion, oh, and also Warden Harper, I just wanna make sure you heard that motion because I believe that your team will be the ones having to provide to us that report. Um, so now on to new business on the agenda. So this is the motion that I introduce every month, a motion to request money from the Incarcerated Individual Welfare Fund to be put on the joint tablet commissary accounts of each person. At the time of me drafting this motion, there were 1,556 folks incarcerated in the jail, $100 for each person. The total cost is $155,600. I would like to make a motion to approve. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Judge Lazara. In favor. Controller Royston. Yes. Ms. Klein. Yes. Ms. Moss. Yes. Uh, Mr. Polarkitsky, voting illegally. Abstention. Um, Judge Halsey. Okay, two abstentions. Sheriff Krauss. Yes. And Council Member Bethany Hallam is a yes. So you are not the so, person. The final motion is. There, for the jail, forward to the JOB members each food safety assessment report and any other inspection report it receives from the Allegheny County Health Department within 30 days of its receipt. Is there a motion? Is there a second to that motion? I thought that's what we just did. No, I thought that was the That other. was about food. This is about the health department reports yeah. about the inspection. Is there a second? Ms. Klein just seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I'm sorry, any uh, any discussion? Did anyone have any discussion about that? Before we talked about it, I apologize. That being said, eyes have are in favor, so. We have one more motion, motion on the carries. agenda. What motion is that? We did it. So with okay. that, the last motion, Sheriff Krause. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, can, 
can, can I just can I just add old business? Mm -hmm. I had I had promised Miss Hallam that I would provide some statistics about the population of the jail and what they're being held for mm -hmm. last month, and I didn't want to forget. Um, Thank I, you. I, I promised her that, and I wanted to make sure that I that I delivered on that. So these stats are as of 4:30 p.m. on July 6th, uh, which is yesterday, 2022. There were 1,456 people in the Allegheny County Jail and 105 people in alternative housing facilities, um, excluding any people with holds by the federal government. Um, 6%, 86 uh, people in the jail itself are serving a county sentence as a result of a new conviction. 23%, 331 of people in the jail had a hold from an external jurisdiction. So that would be other counties or the state or you know someplace else. 42%, 616 of people in the jail were detained by Allegheny County probation. These individuals were detained for violating probation on a crime for which they had previously been convicted. Of these uh, 616 people, 89%, that is 547 people, were of moderate or high risk to reoffend based on their probation proxy risk score. The remainder were being held for a variety of reasons, including violent felonies, awaiting mental health commitments or service plans, and other reasons related to their own safety or the safety of the community. 25%, 360 people in the jail itself were held pretrial only, meaning they had no other um, reasons, such as external holds or detainers keeping them in jail. Of these people, 1% screened as low risk for reoffense uh, based on the Allegheny County locally uh, validated pretrial risk assessment without consideration of the seriousness of their offenses. 85 individuals, approximately 6% of the jail population, are currently being held in the Allegheny County Jail pretrial only on monetary bonds. So there's uh, 85 people that are only in there on monetary bonds. Of these individuals, only nine screened as low risk for new criminal activity, and all of these individuals were facing violent charges. Um, shouldn't be noted also that all pretrial monetary bond cases are reviewed for possible bail modification. Um, just for comparison purposes, uh, the Allegheny County Jail population, excluding federal holds, but including alternative housing, on March 16th, 2022, 2020, so right before COVID, the numbers were 2,075, uh, including 1,859 inmates in the jail itself and 216 people in alternative housing. As of July 6th, I already told you that was 1,456. That's a 22% decrease from uh, two years ago. And alternative housing facilities, the number is currently 105, which is a 51% decrease from pre-COVID. Uh, detainer population in the jail on March 16th of 2020 was 889. And as of yesterday at 430, it was 616. So there is a 31% decrease in the uh, population that's on detainer beds, okay? Thank you so much for that. Can you email that to us? I'd love to see that. Um, I'm assuming I got this by email also. I can, and uh, I can also provide this uh, every month if you would. Love that. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Right. Zara. Sheriff Cross, <laughs> motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thanks. Second. Yeah, I, 